Dead America, El Paso, Part 2. Dead America, The Second Week, Book 3. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter 1. Day Zero Plus Ten. Ten miles east of El Paso lay the sleepy town of Butterfield, Texas. Once upon a time, Leon Jones would have been one of almost a hundred people living on one of the sparse and spread out plots of land. Many joked that Butterfield had been a ghost town before the apocalypse. Who knew they'd be right one day? Leon knelt down beside his camping stove, his tall, fit frame casting a shadow over it. Though in his fifties with graying hair, he was still fit, and with the bloody military fatigues he wore, he didn't look at all helpless. On this morning, however, just after dawn, he wasn't worried about looking helpless or not. All he cared about was the precious commodity in his frying pan, a lone egg. He was determined to fry it perfectly, not too little, not too much, because he didn't know when he'd be able to have another, if he'd ever be able to have another. Food grew scarcer and scarcer these days. The Rivas cartel had spent the better part of the week raiding every home and business close to El Paso, taking anything of value, and the most valuable thing in the apocalypse was food. Leon inhaled deeply, enjoying the scent of the fresh egg he'd been lucky enough to find nestled in the old busted hen house. It's a shame I couldn't find any coffee to go along with this, he said under his breath. He poked the egg gently to make sure it was as firm as he liked it, and nodded to himself in satisfaction. He turned the heat off and tipped the frying pan over a paper plate he'd liberated from the trailer behind him. As he stepped back up into the double wide, he took one last sniff of the fresh morsel before settling on the grimy couch in the living room. The place was musty as all hell, the kind of smell that made Leon think of an old folk's home. There was a thin layer of dust over everything, and he was willing to bet it was there from before the zombies, considering the dry field in the surrounding area. He shoved a putrid-smelling beer can away from him and sighed to himself. I feel you, brother, he muttered to the ether, half to himself and half to the ghost of the previous owner. If I were living here in triple-digit temps half the year, I would have given up on life, too. He leaned forward and bit into the egg, gobbling half of it and chewing slowly, savoring the creamy yolk on his tongue. The pleasure was short-lived, however, at the sound of a rumbling engine. Leon immediately sank to his knees, crawling over to the kitchenette window. He gently pulled back the sheet that was a makeshift curtain and peered out at a white truck skidding to a stop at the small shack-like house across the field. A trio of men jumped out of the vehicle, all carrying AK-47s, with a swagger that was unmistakable. Motherfucking cartel, Leon muttered. He popped the other half of the egg in his mouth and crawled back over to the couch to grab his scoped bolt-action sniper rifle. He double-checked the fresh clip was primed and ready to go and gave the gun a loving pet. Well, girl, looks like we have another day of action on our hands, starting early, too. He headed back to the window, peeking out just as the cartel members kicked the door into the tiny dilapidated house. A zombie staggered out, short compared to the cartel members, and they hooted at it, forming a loose triangle. They teased it, enraging it from behind every time it got too close to somebody. The confused corpse wandered back and forth, screaming and moaning in frustration. Leon tore a bit of the sheet clear from the window, so he could aim his rifle through it but stay mostly hidden. He peered through the scope, just in time for one of the men to get bored of the game and shoot the zombie in the back of the head, splattering rotted brain matter over one of his companions. We used to joke about how interrupting breakfast should be punishable by death. Leon chuckled to himself, low in his throat. Took a while, but finally get to make it real. The cartel member covered in zombie goo stepped up to the shooter, shoving him in anger at being splattered with guts for no reason. The third man simply laughed and watched as his friends argued, bumping chests in a classic display of testosterone. Leon aimed carefully and took a deep breath, his nerves relaxing and his hands steady. As the grappling duo moved so that one's back was to him, 
he pulled the trigger. The bullet went through both of them, dropping both bodies to the ground, as the third man quickly fumbled with his radio, screaming frantically into it. Once upon a time, Leon had been the fastest shot in his battalion, but years behind a desk after his years of service had slowed him a little bit. He put a bullet in the third man's forehead, but not before it seemed he'd been able to get a partial message to whomever was on the other side of that radio. Motherfucker, he muttered to himself and sat back on his heels. He took a beat to begrudge his waning skills and the fact he was about to lose his hideout and then snapped to action. Leon leapt to his feet and ran to the bedroom to grab his two duffel bags. He threw them over his shoulder and peered out the window once again. He didn't hear any more vehicles approaching. He looked out the window on the other side of the trailer, noting a row of three houses closer together about 40 yards across the dusty field. He burst out the front door, tearing around the back of the trailer, just as the roar of approaching engines grew in a crescendo. He peeked back around the corner to see three vehicles cresting the horizon and shook his head, taking off at a sprint for the houses. He made a snap decision upon reaching them to head into the center house, figuring they'd start their search on either the left or the right side. The knob turned easily, miraculously unlocked, and he dove in, slamming it behind him. There was a moan and a shuffle as a zombie staggered in from the living room. Leon jumped past it, giving it a shove in the back and heading down the hallway into the next room, closing the door behind him. Hopefully they'll see that thing and call this place clear, he thought as he took in the bedroom. Hopefully. He dropped his duffel bags in the closet and knelt down in the corner, gripping his rifle tightly. He strained his ears to hear, and luckily, with the thin walls, he was able to hear some voices outside. They spoke in rapid Spanish, and though he was a bit rusty, he could pick up most of what they were saying to each other. Go check that house out, one demanded. A scoff. Why should I do it? I went first on the last one. Yeah, well, I'm driving, the first guy snapped. So unless you want to walk back. The response was mumbled so low that Leon couldn't make it out, but he assumed it was likely something derogatory. There was a loud crack as somebody kicked the door in, and then a thud and a laugh. Hey, I found you a friend, man, somebody said, and then there was a gunshot. Leon assumed they'd found his dead companion. Quit fucking around and search the place, the bossy one snapped. Nobody's in here, the other guy whined. Or what, you think the zombie had a roommate? The sound of the footsteps retreating made the hiding man let out a soft sigh of relief though he knew better than to count his chickens before they hatched. Hey, that was awfully quick, another voice said from outside, sounding skeptical. Fucking zombie in our living room, man, someone protested. That wasn't my question. The other voice grew in volume and sternness. Hey, if you think someone was shacking up with a ghoul, then by all means have a look, the other guy replied. We're moving on to the next house. Fucking slack asses, the stern one barked. I guess I have to do your job for you. Fuck, Leon muttered, swallowing hard. The one time these guys are thorough. His muscles tensed up again at the sound of footsteps inside the house. There was a bit more chatter, but it seemed more slang than anything. He couldn't quite make out what they were saying. The last word, however, was bedroom, and he crept behind the door, drawing his knife. The doorknob turned, and he raised his weapon waiting as the barrel of an AK-47 nosed its way through the crack in the door. It creaked as it opened, and a man entered slowly. Just as he was about to turn his head, Leon dove for him, batting his gun down and pressing the knife to his throat. They grappled a little, and he noted the fear in the guy's eyes as he slammed him back against the dresser, knickknacks clattering to the floor. He couldn't have been older than 25, and Leon fought the churning in his guts at the thought of harming a kid less than half his age. As another cartel member approached from the hallway, the older man spun his prisoner around and curled his knife arm around his throat, using him as a human shield. Put it down or I will gut him like a fucking fish, Leon warned. The approaching cartel member lowered his weapon immediately, 
putting up a tentative hand to try to defuse the situation. Calm down, friend, he said in heavily accented English. I'm not your fucking friend, Leon growled. And if you take one more step, then I start slicing. He dug the blade in a little harder, a bead of blood forming on the top. Hey, you guys okay in there? Somebody yelled from outside. Yeah, Domas here slipped and fell when he saw a dead body. The kid called back, voice surprisingly steady. Guess I should be thankful he didn't shit himself again. The guy outside laughed. Okay, well, this house was clear, so we're going to move on up the road. Sounds good, the prisoner replied. I'm going to piss and then we'll be on our way. Take your time, his comrade yelled back. Whoever shot our boys is probably long gone by now. After a few tense moments, when they were sure the other men were out of earshot, Leon pursed his lips at the cartel member in the hallway. He slung his rifle over his back, putting both of his hands up. The older man lowered the knife and shoved his prisoner away from him. Go on, kid, he said. It's not too bad, the guy murmured in Spanish as he looked at the scratch on the younger man's neck. Go get cleaned up in the kitchen. We're going to have to go soon. As he headed off, Leon leaned against the dresser, crossing his arms as if he hadn't a care in the world. Okay, you've piqued my interest, he said. Why didn't you rat me out to your boys? Because it takes skill, not to mention cantaloupe-sized cojones, to take down three of our men, the cartel member replied with a shrug. Leon furrowed his brow. Yeah, well, they interrupted my breakfast. Understandable. Still doesn't explain why you didn't rat me out, the older man prompted. His opponent shifted his weight. Because I have a use for you. Sorry to burst your bubble, but I don't do work for the cartel, Leon spat wrinkling his nose. There are some of us who don't like what's being done to civilians in El Paso, the man insisted. We've set up a safe haven for them. A man of your particular skills could be very useful to them. Leon cocked his head, studying him for a moment. I'm really thankful you never sat across from me at a poker table, he finally said, because I can't get a read on you. I just lied to protect you, the man replied easily. If I had gotten caught, they would have made an example out of me. That alone should be enough to convince you. Leon pursed his lips. Perhaps. Well, consider the alternative, the man said. Where else are you going to go? The closer you get to town, the more of us that are roaming around, so you can't risk heading back in that direction. You have one road to the east, but the next bit of civilization is about 70 miles away. If the elements don't get you, then the wildlife will. Leon sighed. So what do you propose? You do not leave this room, and you don't make a sound until we are gone, the man instructed. In a couple of hours, my man Francisco will be by to pick you up. Just be ready to move when he gets here. There was a moment of silence, and then recognition, and the man turned to leave. Hey, Leon said quietly. You never told me your name. No, I didn't, the cartel member replied. The fewer people who know who we are, the safer we stay. Good luck, friend. With that, he headed to the front door to meet up with the younger man, wiping the last of the blood from his neck. He and Leon nodded to each other before the older man closed the bedroom door once again. He sat down on the floor, out of sight of the windows, and sighed heavily. He looked at his scuffed watch and couldn't help but smile. Man, not even eight in the morning, and already a shit-filled day. Chapter Two Leon rolled a pen across his fingers and back, checking his watch again. It had been about two hours, and he'd been able to fall into a zen-like trance while spinning the pen around his fingers a multitude of ways. He hadn't wanted to move from beneath the window in case of potential bad company, but it had remained quiet. At the rumble of a single engine, he got up onto his knees and peeked through the blinds as an SUV approached the house. Leon grabbed his duffel bags and stashed them next to the front door, rifle at the ready as the vehicle came to a stop out front. He cracked the door and watched carefully as the driver's side window rolled down. The man behind the wheel looked to be in his mid-thirties, with chocolate hair and aviator sunglasses. Well, you coming or what? he asked. Leon opened the door a little wider. 
You Francisco? Who the fuck else would I be? The man shot back. Leon rolled his eyes. Well, the first three who showed up today sure as hell weren't Francisco. And that's why I'm here. Francisco put a hand to his chest. Now do you want to ride to safety, or are you going to start huffing it up the road? The older man shrugged, picked up his bags, and flung open the door, jogging down the front steps to the vehicle. He opened the hatchback and tossed his bags in before skirting the SUV to get into the passenger seat. He raised an eyebrow as he turned sideways, surveying the three people sitting in the back seat. There was a middle-aged couple clutching each other on one side, eyes wide with terror, and next to them, a twenty-something petite but athletic woman with jet black hair. Folks, Leon greeted them with a tip of his hat. How we doing? Francisco rolled his eyes and punched the gas, starting the next leg of their journey. Oh, we're doing just peachy, the young woman piped up, sarcasm dripping from her tongue. Let's see, my best friend was shot in the street two days ago because he accidentally bumped into some cartel thug. My roommate vanished yesterday, and I can only imagine what horrors she's dealing with. And now I'm fleeing the city with two people so fucked up they can't even speak, and some over-the-hill dude in bloody army fatigues. Of course, none of that even includes the whole dead rising to feast on the living bullshit. Leon blinked at her and then nodded casually. Well, you gotta look on the bright side of things. At least it ain't raining. Yes, Mr. Military Man, we are truly a blessed group of people. She rolled her eyes. He shrugged. We are more blessed than you know, assuming you believe in that stuff. Oh, yeah? She crossed her arms. How so? He cocked his head. Well, for starters, we've outlived at least 90% of our fellow countrymen. 90%? Her jaw dropped, and there was a moment where it seemed nobody in the car could even breathe. You can't possibly know that. Leon pinched the fabric of his shirt and tugged it a few times. The military garb isn't just for attracting the ladies, he said. I'm military intelligence. At least I was before this shit show hit. So... She cleared her throat, voice thick. It's like this everywhere? Worse than a lot of places, he replied. Some of the major cities are on the verge of being completely wiped out. Even with our southern neighbors paying us an unwelcome visit, we're still ahead of the game. I thought you military intelligence guys were a bunch of geeks behind computer screens. Francisco cut in as he turned a corner. How the hell did you take out three of my guys? I wasn't always in intelligence, Leon explained, shaking his head. Started my career as a sniper, ran several dozen missions in various theaters over the years, decided to make the career change after some dumbass nearly got me killed because they sucked at their job. I wanted to do my part to make sure the next kid who filled my boots didn't have to die due to negligence. The young woman in the back leaned forward. That was noble of you. She seemed sincere, her sarcasm gone. Eh, hey, don't chalk it up to nobility. My black ass loves me some air conditioning, which was in very short supply out in the field. Leon chuckled and turned to the driver. So you gonna tell us where we headed? Francisco nodded. Is a little town called Fabens, about 30 miles southeast from town. What is this place anyway? The young woman asked, leaning forward. It's a refugee camp of sorts that was hastily set up by Rodriguez, the second in command of the Rivas cartel. Francisco explained. Some of us, like myself, have been rescuing people who would be eliminated or worse, and getting them to a place where they have a chance at survival. How many have you gotten out? She pressed. He shook his head. Not nearly as many as I would like. And the cartel just lets them be? Leon raised an eyebrow. Francisco barked a bitter laugh. The cartel doesn't know about them yet. Rodriguez is the one in charge of exploring the region, so he's been steering everyone to the north and east, but it's only a matter of time before he has no choice but to send people south. Well, nothing like a little impending doom to get the morning rolling, Leon said with a sigh. I'm Leon, by the way, he said, turning again to the passengers in the back. Clara, the young woman replied and shook his hand. She motioned to her companions. No idea what their names are, they don't say anything. Francisco made a hard left turn off of the main road bumbling down a dirt path leading to the east. Hang on tight, we're taking the long way around. Chapter Three Detective Rogers walked down the main road leading into Fabens, 
enjoying the morning sun bathing everything in a warm glow. It made even the dusty ground look ethereal, beautiful, pre-apocalypse. He reached up and made sure all of the edges of the bandage on the side of his head were secure. The wound where his ear had been was taking its sweet time to heal, and getting dust all up in there wouldn't help anything along. He sighed and smoothed back his thinning black hair. For a man in his early forties, sometimes he felt like he was twice that. He approached the bridge over the large drainage ditch. Harry, Charlie, what do you say, boys? He asked of the two older men standing guard. Detective Rogers? Harry greeted, lowering his makeshift spear that somebody had fashioned out of a broomstick. Good to see you on this fine morning. Rogers inclined his head, leaning on the railing over the ten-foot-wide ditch. Any activity overnight? Nothing too bad, Charlie replied, shaking his head. A dozen or so making their way up to the cars. He motioned to the vehicles lined up bumper to bumper across the bridge as the barrier. About twice that much wandering up the ditch, Harry added, motioning over his shoulder. Roger stepped over to peek down on that side, noting about twenty or so zombies in the deep gully, reaching up in vain at the fresh meat. I figured after lunch we can take care of them, Charlie suggested. The boys on the west side bridge have the extender to take them out from above. Rogers nodded, pulling back from the railing. There been any other survivors coming up from the south side of town? Not for two days now, Harry replied. I'm pretty sure everybody who's going to make it out has done so. Charlie straightened. Although you just give us the order and we'll get a team together and go door to door. This was a town of 8,000 people, Rogers explained, shaking his head. 7,800 of which lived south of this drainage ditch. We haven't seen anywhere near that many zombies wander our way, so God only knows how many are on the other side. I don't like the thought of leaving survivors over there, but for the moment it's going to have to stay that way. Charlie nodded, shoulders slumping a bit. I understand, detective. An air horn cut harshly through the calm morning air from the direction of the interstate. Roger sighed. Besides, we have other issues to deal with at the moment. He put a hand on Charlie's shoulder. I tell you what, let me see what sort of chaos is at our doorstep, and if it's not too bad, I'll see if I can't find a runner to get a message to any potential survivors over there. We got a deal? The older man nodded, eyes brightening. Okay, thank you. Roger smiled and gave his shoulder a reassuring squeeze before giving both men a wave and heading back off towards town. His smile fell from his face as he put distance between him and the men, guilt gnawing at his stomach from the lie he'd just told. There was no way in hell he'd be sending anyone across that bridge. It was far too risky. The main part of the community consisted of a small line of buildings next to a strip mall. Rogers approached as an SUV pulled up, skidding to a stop in the dirt. As the dust settled, Francisco jumped out and approached him. Detective? He greeted as the passenger door opened, revealing a tall black man in military fatigues. Rogers nodded. Morning, what have you got for me today? A shell-shocked couple, a nice young lady, and a badass motherfucker, the military man declared as he skirted the hood of the vehicle. Humble, the detective commented, raising an eyebrow. I like him. Leon, the military man said with a grin, extending his hand. Rogers returned it and shook heartily. I'm Detective Rogers, welcome to Fabens. A few locals opened the back doors of the vehicle, helping the frightened couple out and beginning to unload the bags. Clara thanked a man that helped her jump down from the SUV and then strolled over to the trio of men like she owned the place. And who might you be? Rogers asked politely. She planted a thumb on her chest. I'm Clara. Welcome, the detective said. So how is the scouting going? Francisco piped up as he stretched his legs. I don't know if you ever visited this area before the world came crashing down, but it's slim pickings out here, Rogers admitted. We've gotten as far east as Alamore, but the communities are so small that most of them don't even have a gas station, let alone grocery stores. Well, what about this place? Francisco shrugged, motioning in the general direction of the city. There are hundreds of buildings on the other side of the bridge. Roger shook his head immediately and also potentially thousands of those creatures. We have maybe a hundred bullets in this town, so if somebody goes over there and attracts a horde, we could very easily get overrun. 
You get me some better weaponry and I'll risk it. But until then, we're not going over there. His tone was sharp and final. Francisco threw up his hands, undeterred by the stern detective. Do you not understand what's at stake here? He snapped. If the cartel discovers this place and you don't have anything to show your value to them, they will wipe you off the map. Not only that, but they will make examples of those of us who helped you. Rodriguez is doing everything he can to divert search parties away from this area, but it's not going to be long before he has no choice but to send people this way. A day, maybe two at the most. Well, if that's the case, then it sounds like you need to get on with supplying us with weapons, Rogers replied, crossing his arms. Francisco narrowed his eyes. Send people to the other side of that bridge, he growled. No. The detective jutted out his chin. It doesn't do us a damn bit of good to find something useful over there if we end up being overrun. He took a deep breath to try to defuse the harsh energy in the air. My scouts are hitting Van Horn today. It's a sizable town with a grocery store, and with any luck, a liquor store. You'd better make sure you find something that will make the boss happy, Francisco warned. Because if you don't, it's all our asses. Rogers let out a deep whoosh of breath. Trust me, nobody's more aware of that than I am. Good luck, Francisco said, voice softer, and offered his hand. They shook firmly, a silent apology passing between them as their gazes connected. He turned and got back into the now empty SUV, making sure there were no locals behind him as he backed up and peeled off back the way he'd come. Well, Leon said as he stretched his arms high above his head. In the span of an hour, I went from potentially dying alone to potentially dying in a group. I guess that's progress. Rogers couldn't help but chuckle, shaking his head. Sounds like you've had a fun day. Sniped three assholes, got into a Mexican standoff, and had a freshly cooked breakfast, Leon explained with a toothy grin. The detective raised an eyebrow. Was there a coffee with that breakfast? Shit, man, I wish. Leon replied with a snap of his fingers. I haven't seen any of that in about a week. Rogers clapped him on the back. Why don't you come inside and I'll see if I can rectify that travesty, he said, and we can talk about what you can help us out with. Leon nodded and leaned over to grab his gear. Clara cleared her throat in an overly dramatic manner. And what about me? She asked, arms crossed and foot tapping in the dirt. Rogers motioned to an older woman at a nearby picnic table, speaking in low tones to the shell-shocked couple. If you want to go talk to Helena over there, I'm sure she has something you can help her with. The young woman glanced at the group and then back to the detective, rolling her eyes. So you have an overabundance of able-bodied people who can venture out and find supplies then? No, Rogers replied slowly, rubbing his chin. He wasn't quite sure what to make of the petite woman as of yet. We're quite short-handed, actually. But do you really want to go out into zombie-infested areas? Fuck no, I don't, Clara snapped, planting her hands firmly on her hips. But you know what? I also don't want to become a prisoner of the cartel. You'd be lucky if they'd just put a bullet in your brain. You know what they do to me? He winced. He knew what she was insinuating, and she was absolutely right. He pursed his lips and looked her dead in the eye. Are you capable of handling yourself out there? He asked. I run marathons for fun, she replied. So if I get into a situation where fighting isn't an option, I can certainly outpace them. I'm guessing that's more than you can say about the bulk of the residents here. She waved her hand in the general direction of a cluster of elderly people folding sheets on a porch across the street. Okay, Rogers said in defeat. I'll introduce you to Trenton. He's my head scout. If he thinks you can be of use out there, you're in. If not, then you're staying here. It's his ass on the line, so it's his decision on who he brings. Fair? She nodded. Fair. Well, come on then, he said as he turned back to Leon. Let me show you all the command center. Chapter Four No offense, Rogers, Leon said as he entered the old reception hall. But I'm not sure this room lives up to the name Command Center. He didn't look terribly impressed as he took in the cheap folding tables around the perimeter of the mid-sized room. There were various maps and whiteboards along the walls, with a smattering of people around studying documents and making lists. There's a fresh pot of coffee in the corner, the detective said with a grin, motioning to the little camping stove in the corner. 
Leon laid eyes on the happily bubbling percolator atop it and snapped his fingers. This is the best goddamn command center I've ever set foot in. Mr. Rogers, would you and your friends like some coffee? A woman with short, bone-white hair walked up to them. She looked to be in her 70s, paper-thin skin crinkling as she smiled. I just brewed it up. Thank you, Ethel, the detective said warmly, taking her hand in his. I think we'd all like one. She turned her bright, friendly eyes on Leon and Clara, who couldn't help but smile back at her. She shuffled off to check the brew as Rogers waved them over to a map of El Paso and surrounding areas on the wall. There were several red X marks over some of the smaller towns leading east on the I-10, a few with a circle around them. This is what we're working with, Rogers explained. Antiquated, I know, but we're lucky we have a map that even goes out this far. Clara leaned forward to study it. What are the marks? The X's are for places we've scouted, and the ones with circles around them are places we've cleaned out, the detective explained. I know you overheard me talking to Francisco, but we haven't found hardly anything that would be of value to the cartel boss. What is he deemed valuable? Leon asked, scratching the back of his head. Food? Medicine? Roger shook his head. Alcohol. Leon's eyebrow shot to his forehead. Let me see if I got this right. He's making you risk people's lives to go out on a beer run? Tequila, actually, but yeah, that's a pretty accurate description of the situation. The detective sighed. Clara's brow furrowed. Why would he put that above everything else? The cartel controls everything across the border, Rogers explained. Rumor has it that they have a pretty sophisticated farming operation underway, and I would assume he doesn't give a shit if people get sick and die. Leon scoffed. Given the current state of the world, I'm guessing high-quality tequila will soon be in extremely short supply. Bingo, Rogers replied, making his hand into a finger gun and popping it off at his new companion. Regardless of the absurdity of it, we need to locate some if we want to get on his good side. Leon pursed his lips. Or at least stay off his bad side. At least, the detective agreed, and then turned his attention to an approaching man. Trenton, good timing. He greeted the tall and muscular 20-something. I'd like you to meet Leon and your new recruit, Clara. The sandy-haired man cocked his head. New recruit, huh? He raised an eyebrow at the young woman. You think you can hack it out there? I survived a week living under the cartel, Clara replied, bristling a little. Trenton shrugged. Good enough for me. We're short-handed anyway. We lose somebody else? Rogers furrowed his brow. Carver wiped out on his bike. The younger man replied, rolling his eyes. Pretty sure it's a broken arm, but Helena is tending to him now. The detective rubbed the bridge of his nose. Damn. Okay, looks like he'll be on bridge duty for a while. Ethel approached with a tray of steaming mugs of coffee and her warm smile. Ah, thank you, milady. Leon moaned with happiness, savoring the scent of the fresh brew. She chuckled as she set the mugs down on the table and retreated with the tray to a chorus of thanks from the others. So you find anything of value in that last run? Rogers asked as he sipped his steaming mug. Trenton shook his head. Nothing that's gonna help. Only found one bottle of tequila, but it's so cheap I think it would be better used to degrease my engine. Well then, the detective shrugged. You boys ready to hit Van Horn? About as ready as we're ever gonna be, Trenton replied. The size of that place scares me. Leon raised an eyebrow. Scares you more than the cartel? Bullet to the head is better than a bite to the neck, the younger man explained. Leon nodded and took a long sip of his brew. Can't argue with that, he admitted. Well, it's an hour down the road, so y'all better get on truckin', Rogers cut in. Francisco came by earlier and told us we're on a timetable. Trenton paled. How long? A day, maybe two at most, the detective replied. Fantastic, the younger man declared, sarcasm evident in his tone. He turned to Clara. Okay, grab your weapon and let's head out. Her cheeks pinked. Um, she blinked a few times. The cartel kind of frowned on civilians having weapons, so I don't really have one. Leon unsnapped the knife holster from his belt and held it out to her. Here you go, he offered. This baby served me well for years, Hopefully it will do the same for you. She took it gingerly, 
giving him a thin smile. Thank you. Roger sighed and reached down to his ankle, lifting the leg of his jeans to reveal a snub-nosed 38. Ammo is really tight around here, so you'll only have the six shots that are chambered. Should be good in a pinch, though, he said as he held out the weapon. Clara took it and stuffed it into her pocket with a somber nod. With where we're going, the last thing you want to do is make a lot of noise anyway, Trenton piped up. Being the center of attention is definitely something you don't want to be. Pre-apocalypse, I would have argued with you, Clara replied with a chuckle and motioned for him to lead the way outside. Leon watched them go, almost zoning out as he sipped his coffee. The dark liquid was more comforting than he'd ever known it to be. So, Rogers said, leaning against the table and drawing his new charge out of his reverie. What do you bring to the table? Leon took a deep breath. Well, for starters, I can shoot a motherfucker dead at 200 yards. More importantly, however, I think I can help you out with your less than stellar mapping. Oh, really? The detective asked, raising an eyebrow. And how are you gonna pull that one off? Leon drained his mug with a satisfying smack of his lips. I tell you what, you grab me another cup of coffee and I'll show you. Rogers grinned. Deal. Chapter Five Trenton led Clara through the parking lot towards two men on dirt bikes. They looked to be in the early 20s, fit and bronze in the sunlight. Clara raised an eyebrow. When he'd said that their buddy had fallen off of his bike, she hadn't assumed a motorized vehicle. He was lucky to have gotten away with just a broken arm. There was a dune buggy, too, housing another 20-something man though he looked out of place with the handsome frat boys with his freckled skin and rounder belly. Hey, Trenton, you find yourself a girlfriend? One of the dirt bike guys said. The other one hooted and gave him a high five. Yeah, man, she's all kinds of hot. Clara didn't even break stride, stalking up to the two of them with her chin high. She put a hand on her hip, staring them down as she tapped the hilt of her knife with a sharp fingernail. Ah, the first guy stammered. I think we may have gotten off on the wrong foot here. She cocked her head. You think? Clara, I'd like you to meet Reed and Jay, Trenton said, obviously amused with the exchange. From this point on, they will be fine, upstanding citizens. Gentlemen, this is Clara. Jay gulped and smiled nervously, nodding at her. Reed gave her a little salute. And over here is Malcolm. Trenton inclined his head to the driver in the dune buggy. He's going to be your ride to Van Horn. Clara gave the duo a thousand-watt smile and then turned on her heel, heading over to the vehicle. She raised her eyebrow at the amount of duct tape holding the thing together. Every metal surface seemed to be buried in rust, and there were even exposed wires sticking out from the engine. Hi. She gave the driver a wave and motioned to the hole where the windshield should have been. Is this thing actually going to make it to Van Horn? It's looking a little worse for wear. Malcolm smiled and patted the steering wheel. This is a tough old girl, he said. I've had her for years, and she hasn't let me down yet. He reached into a compartment and pulled out a pair of goggles, holding them out to her. You're gonna need these. The windshield is kinda missing. Clara laughed and put them on, shaking her head as she slid into the passenger's seat. All right, she said. Let's do this. He turned the key, and the engine chugged a little before quieting down again. The dirt bike started up no problem, rumbling to life, and Reed and Jay peeled out of the parking lot. Trenton wandered over. Starter trouble again? He asked. Malcolm nodded. Yeah, she'll get going here in a minute, he replied. Y'all go ahead, we'll catch up. Trenton gave him a little salute and hopped on his own dirt bike, kicking it on and then speeding off after the others. Malcolm tried again, but the motor just wouldn't turn over. Clara raised an eyebrow. Usually have this kind of performance issue, she asked. He blushed. Only around pretty girls, he said, and then wrinkled his nose as if he immediately regretted saying it. Clara laughed it off, hoping to put him at ease, and this time the engine started up into a low rumble. Malcolm sighed in relief and popped the dune buggy into gear. All right, hang on. Chapter Six Rogers headed back over to Leon, a fresh steaming mug in hand. 
The older man was setting up a heavy-duty-looking laptop hooked up to a power bar. What? The detective trailed off, mouth opening and closing in shock. What you got there? This, sir, is a state-of-the-art communications laptop, Leon replied as he rummaged around in one of his duffel bags. This allows me to have the ability to tap into satellites currently circling the globe. Um, Roger scratched the back of his head. Does it require power? Leon nodded. A shitload. Sorry to say that we haven't had power in this town since we got here, the detective admitted. Not an issue, my friend, Leon replied with a toothy grin. Be a pal and point me to a window that faces south. Rogers furrowed his brow and motioned to one of the large windows on the south end of the building, watching with fascination as Leon pulled out a rolled-up piece of black material. There was a cable attached to one end, and it flopped down as the tall man flung open the roll like a beach towel. He headed over and opened the window, hanging the material out the side of the building and then closing it to hold it in place. Perfect, Leon murmured as he ran the cable back to his power bar. Well, Rogers said, impressed as he shook his head. What do we have here? This here is a portable, flexible solar panel, Leon explained. It's capable of powering this laptop and pretty much everything else in this room, although it's gonna take a little while for this baby to get up to speed. The detective let out a long whistle. And how exactly did you acquire this stuff, if you don't mind me asking? I was visiting for a training exercise at Fort Bliss on the northeast side of the city, Leon replied as he opened up the computer. When this shit went down, it didn't take long for the base commander to get the order to pull back to Kansas. Now, one of the perks of being military intelligence is that very few people have the clearance to know what my orders are, and the base commander was not on that list. I simply told him my orders were to take what I needed from the base and move to an undisclosed location. I don't think he really gave a shit if I was telling the truth or not. So he shrugged, threw me a set of keys, and told me to go wild. Forty-five minutes later, I had a jeep loaded down with gear. Rogers rubbed his chin thoughtfully. In the early days of this thing, there were some rumors going around about Fort Bliss. Is it really as bad as what people say? I'll admit I don't have first-hand knowledge, Leon said with a sigh. Once I got out, I had no intention of going back. But a few days ago, I got in touch with a few boys from the base who decided that the military life no longer appealed to them. Based on what they told me, it's a complete and total shit show there. The detective winced. That bad? According to them, the base commander didn't have the stones to do what was needed, which was to put down the infected men, Leon explained, voice hard. Instead, he sealed the camp up tight and left them in there to turn. Roger's jaw dropped. Christ. He shook his head in disbelief. So there's a zombie army inside the base? Unless the cartel has gone in and cleaned it out, Leon said bitterly. The detective let out a deep whoosh of breath. That hasn't happened, he replied, thankful for small miracles. Francisco said they sent a small squad to scope the place out, hoping there was some military-grade gear in there. He said one guy was able to get to the fence, but had a dozen bites on him. After that, they doubled the locks and put some guards on it to make sure nothing got out. Well, that's a good piece of news, at least, Leon said. Don't want the cartel to be running around with military shit. Rogers peered down his nose at the flickering computer screen. So your buddies, any chance they can come help us? Not any time soon, Leon replied with a sigh. We're not supposed to chat for three more days. And besides, last I heard they were roaming around New Mexico. It's doubtful they could get here in a timely manner. The detective wrinkled his nose. That's a shame. He paused, taking a sip of his coffee. At least it's comforting to know that there are some people out there on our side. Leon nodded and raised his mug in a salute to the sentiment. Chapter 7 Francisco sped up the I-10, headed to the cartel checkpoint, just southeast of El Paso. He passed heaps of corpses that had been chewed up by the mounted machine guns on the guard trucks defending the checkpoint. He slowed to a stop at the gate, leaning out the window to the armed guard standing there. Hey, can you let me through? He asked. I'm on my way to report in to Rodriguez. It's going to be a moment, sir, the guard replied, putting up a hand. 
We were told this is a closed checkpoint, so we have to get your clearance. Francisco growled. Do you know who I am? Yes, sir, Mr. Francisco, I do. The guard swallowed nervously. But I also know who told me to close this checkpoint, and I don't want to anger them either. The driver sighed, leaning his head back against his seat. You're right, he said, waving a hand. Do what you need to do. The guard nodded in appreciation and stepped away from the vehicle as he pressed on the little communicator in his ear. He turned around and spoke in quiet tones. Francisco began to tap on the steering wheel a bit, but forced himself to stop. He needed to keep his cool, cool as a cucumber. The guard turned back to him. Sir, if you don't mind me asking, what were you doing southeast of the city? I do mind, actually, the driver snapped. He knew he had to be firm and unrelenting, even as his heart pounded in his chest. I don't report to you. If you or whoever is on the other side of that little radio wants to know what the fuck I was doing, then they can go ask Rodriguez. That's who I report to. Now, if there's nothing else, can you kindly move the fuck out of my way before I run your ass down? The guard touched his earpiece and then nodded, waving at one of the guard trucks to move out of the way. Have a good day, Mr. Francisco, he said. The driver huffed and rolled up his window, kicking up dust as he sped through the checkpoint. As Francisco peeled out towards El Paso, two men stepped out of one of the guard trucks. Juan Pablo straightened his tie and suit jacket and strolled over to watch the truck disappearing into the distance. Hector, did you find any of that at all suspicious? He asked, inclining his head to his tall partner. Hector nodded his bald head. Every single word of it, sir. I'm wondering if you'll run a quick errand for me, Juan Pablo said, crossing his arms. His partner straightened. Anywhere you wish, sir. Grab a truck and take a drive down the interstate here, his superior instructed. Spend half an hour or so and see if you find anything that might be of note. Hector nodded. I'll return soon, sir. Thank you, Juan Pablo replied, clapping him on the shoulder before sending him off. He stared at the cloud of dust, still hovering where Francisco had driven off. What are you up to? Chapter 8 Francisco drove slowly through the streets of El Paso, surveying the ever-depressing scene. Cartel members walked the streets, chests puffed out and heads held high, guns always at the ready with their swagger turned up to a thousand. Terrified civilians peeked out through broken windows, meekly staying inside to avoid drawing attention to themselves and risk getting killed. The zombies weren't the biggest threat here. He turned down the main strip toward City Hall and slowed to a stop outside. He jumped down and furrowed his brow. Hey, you can't park here. A cartel member with a cigar hanging out of his mouth barked. Can't you see we're setting up a celebration? Francisco shrugged as he sauntered over. He could see. There were at least a dozen civilians climbing up ladders at gunpoint to hang decorations all over the street. Relax, I'm only going to be here for a few minutes, Francisco said. I don't care if you're just here to take a piss, the cigar man snapped. You need to move that car now. Francisco steeled his gaze. I'm here to meet with Rodriguez. The tone of finality and the name drop seemed to tame the man, and he pulled the cigar from his mouth to hawk a thick glob of spit onto the ground. Fine, he growled. Just be back quickly. We have a lot of work to do. Francisco waved his hand around his head. What is all this anyway? he asked. It's a celebration of Tiago Rivas, the man who led us to the taking of El Paso. The cigar man bellowed, spreading his arms, and several cartel members dotting the street raised their fists and hooted cheers in response. Francisco shook his head. Another celebration, what a waste. It's never a waste to celebrate our glorious boss, the cigar man balked. The shorter man turned towards City Hall, or at least what used to be City Hall. Yeah, let's see if you're saying that when we're out of food. He strode into the building, taking in the flurry of cartel members running back and forth like chickens with their heads cut off. He managed to snatch someone by the arm on the way by. Have you seen Rodriguez? He asked. The young cartel member pointed down the hall to the right, where the door to a large office stood open. Francisco nodded in thanks and headed in. 
Rodriguez stood over a large table, a map of the city spread out beneath him. He slammed his hand down hard, startling the four men standing at the other end of the table. I don't want to hear your excuses, Rodriguez said, voice low and menacing. I want the asshole who gunned down three of our brothers found and brought to justice. Sir, we've checked the area twice. One of the men stammered meekly, wincing as his superior slammed his hand down on the table again. Well, check it again, Rodriguez boomed. Burn the place to the fucking ground if you must, but this person needs to be found. Do not come back without them. The four cartel members nodded before rushing out the door, eager to get out of the fire. Francisco shut the door behind them and chuckled. You know they're never going to find him, he said. Rodriguez grinned, taking a sip of his coffee. Of course, but it will keep them busy for another few hours. He sat down in his office chair, motioning for his friend to sit opposite him. So, you are able to safely extract him? Yes, he's with the detective in Fabens, Francisco replied. Good, his superior replied with a nod. Have they made any progress? Francisco sighed as he took a seat. No, they haven't. Rodriguez pursed his lips. Did you explain the situation? The door suddenly burst open, interrupting them proper, as a fuming young man in an Armani suit stormed into the office. Why are you sending my men back out to that abandoned town? He demanded. Rodriguez sighed, as if dealing with an insolent child. Because, Angel, I want the man who killed our people found and dealt with. Fuck him, Angel spat the words. He's probably in the middle of the desert dying of thirst right now. We need to be expanding our empire. In due time, Rodriguez replied, voice still calm and level. The younger man snarled, resting his fists on the table and leaning forward. The time is now. You have dragged your feet and held us back long enough. It's time for us to move down the I-10 and claim it for ourselves. We will head that way when I say we're ready to, the older man explained, as he had what felt like a hundred times before. Angel sneered. My father, your father put me in charge for a reason, Rodriguez cut in, setting down his cup. I don't care if you're the boss's son. If he wanted you to have a decision-making position, he would have given it to you. But he gave it to me. So go and do as you're told, and take your men back to Butterfield to find the person who murdered three of our brothers in cold blood. If there is resistance in the area, we need to quash it. Angel grunted and turned on his shiny leather heel, stalking to the door. He paused in the frame as he wrapped his hand around the knob. I know you're stalling for a reason, he warned, a mischievous sparkle in his defiant eyes. There's something down the interstate that you want to keep to yourself. I don't know what you're hiding, but I will find out. You can guarantee that. He slammed the door behind him, leaving a deafening silence in his wake. I can't keep them at bay much longer. Rodriguez admitted quietly, pinching the bridge of his nose. If the detective doesn't find something and find it soon, it's not going to be good. Francisco shook his head. Angel might not be our most pressing issue. Christ, what now? His friend demanded. He took a deep breath. I got stopped at the checkpoint on the southeast side of town. Someone was in one of the trucks, relaying questions to the guard. If it was someone loyal to Angel, they might put two and two together. Rodriguez sighed, shaking his head. He picked up his mug again, swirling the brown liquid around instead of taking a sip. Did the detective ask for anything that could be helpful to them? He said they're short on guns and ammo, but it's too risky to get into the armory, Francisco said with a shrug. His friend pursed his lips, seeming lost in thought for a time. I'm afraid we don't have a choice, he said finally. We're out of time. See what you can get to him. Just make sure you take the long way around to avoid that checkpoint. Francisco got to his feet and nodded. I won't let you down. He headed for the door, taking one last glance back at his superior's contemplative face before he exited the office. Chapter 9 Trenton skidded to a stop a half mile away from Van Horn leaning on one leg as he pulled a set of binoculars from one of his saddlebags. He surveyed the area as the others pulled up behind him. One by one, everyone turned off their engines, and he lowered the binoculars. 
Okay, looks like there's a string of buildings on the north side of the interstate that leads into the main part of town, Trenton said. I'm only seeing a handful of shops, none of which look like a liquor store. Well, hell, there has to be one, Reed threw his hands up. How the hell can anybody live out here and not drink? Trenton shook his head. If there is one, I'm not seeing it. You know, Jay piped up. I went out on a couple of dates with a girl from Van Horn. She lived in a pretty nice house. Reed snorted. Bitch, nobody that lives in a nice house would ever go out with you. Okay, a nice house for the area, Jay rolled his eyes. Nicer than anything else I saw driving through the town. I figure if we can't find a liquor store, that might be our best bet. It's thin, Trenton mused. But I've heard thinner. He rubbed his chin. God damn it, Malcolm muttered furiously tapping one of the gauges on the dune buggy. Trenton raised an eyebrow. Problem? I'm almost out of gas, the younger man replied sheepishly. Jesus Christ, man, can you not keep up with this shit? Reed snapped. Malcolm scowled. I filled up with you guys. I should still have half a tank. He shook his head. Must have sprung a leak again. Trenton sighed and put the binoculars to his eyes again, trying to find a gas station. Looks like there's a truck stop on the south side of the interstate, he said. You two get filled up, then circle around the east side of the city and see if you can find a liquor store. Clara raised her hand. How are we going to fill up if there's no power? It's a truck stop in a small town in the middle of the desert, Malcolm replied. More than likely, they have a generator. If a storm rolls through and knocks the power out, they're not exactly at the top of the list to get it fixed, so they have to be prepared. Trenton got off of his bike and walked over to them, putting a firm hand on the young man's shoulder. Do not go through the center of town, do you understand? He asked. God only knows what's in there. Yeah, of course, Malcolm replied, blinking rapidly. I'm not stupid. Reed snorted. Says the man who's out of gas. Fuck you, Malcolm snapped, narrowing his eyes. Trenton clapped his hands together sharply. Drop it, both of you, he warned. Malcolm, Clara, the three of us are going to go around the west side of town and check out the houses on the north side. We're going to be on frequency 13. Call only if there is an emergency or if you locate our target. He held up his walkie-talkie and gave it a little shake. Malcolm pulled out his own and handed it over to Clara. Here, you'd better hang on to this, he said. I have a tendency to misplace them. If something goes wrong and we lose contact, meet back at this spot in two hours. Trenton instructed. Any questions? He waited a beat, but nobody said anything. Okay, let's do this. He strode over and got back on his bike, kicking it back to life. He watched the dune buggy trundle off towards the truck stop, and he turned to lead the others along the west edge of town. They found a dirt trail, likely a walking trail for the locals, and though it was a bumpy ride, it was a lot safer than going through town. Trenton slowed to a stop when he spotted a row of relatively expensive-looking houses through the trees. Is that them? He asked. Yep, Jay replied with a nod. That's them. What's that building over there? Reed asked, pointing to a fairly large structure on the far side. Trenton pulled out his binoculars, surveying a football field with bleachers next to it. Looks like a school, he said. If there's nothing in the houses, we could give that a shot, Reed suggested. Jay's brow furrowed. You think we're gonna find the booze we're looking for inside a school? Shit, man, every teacher I know is a borderline alcoholic, Reed replied, rolling his eyes. I mean, wouldn't you be if you had to deal with dozens of assholes like us every day? Trenton shook his head. Have you ever seen a teacher's pay stub? Reed shrugged. Nope. Let's just say they aren't going to be buying top shelf stuff, the older man replied and turned the binoculars back to the houses. They were out in the open, no fences lining any of the yards. A few zombies roamed about behind the easternmost house, but that seemed to be the only activity. Route looks pretty clear, Trenton reported. Just two of those things outside the house on the left. Reed crossed his arms. So we start on the right? No, we should take them out. Trenton shook his head and got off of his bike, rolling it down into the bushes. If we draw their attention and they start making a racket, they could bring the whole town down on us. Jay reached down for the long metal pipe he'd secured to the side of his bike before walking it over next to Trenton's. 
he made sure the kickstand was secure and then got out of the way so Reed could join them. The latter took off his button-up overshirt, leaving him in a beater with his weapon harness housing a mini metal baseball bat. Trenton pulled up one of his pant legs to free his machete and turned to the duo. Okay, which one of you wants to pick the lock? He asked. The two younger men turned towards each other and immediately engaged in a quick game of rock, paper, scissors. Damn it, Jay muttered as his friend cut his flattened hand with his finger scissors. Reed scoffed. It's just one zombie, man. You can handle it. He clapped his companion on the back. Last time I swung this thing, I pulled a muscle, Jay whined, giving the pipe a few whooshes through the air. Trenton waved for them to follow him through the trees. It's a bit of a walk, so you have time to limber up. Everybody remember where we parked, Reed said, making a beeping noise with his mouth as he mimed using an auto lock clicker. When they reached the tree line, they crouched in the bushes behind the backyard. The zombies stared up at the house as they ambled back and forth, not paying attention. You get that door open quick, Trenton whispered to Reed. We don't know what else is around here. The younger man nodded and got ready to spring. Trenton dove out of the bushes first, leaping for the zombie on the left. His footsteps alerted it, just in time for it to turn to face a machete to the mouth, the blade cutting its head in half. As it crumpled to the ground, Jay lowered his shoulder and caught the other one in the back, sending it crashing to the ground. Before it could get back up, he landed his pipe onto the back of its head twice in quick succession. The creature twitched once and then fell still, and Jay rotated his shoulder a bit, switching the pipe to his other hand. You good? Trenton whispered, and the younger man gave him a thumbs up. They approached Reed, who was still working on the lock, digging around in there for all he was worth. Jay tapped him on the shoulder and pointed at the mat he knelt on. His friend moved and they lifted it, finding a silver key beneath. Jay smacked him on the shoulder and grinned, and Reed shook his head, shooting him the bird before sliding the key into the lock. He gave a silent countdown before pulling the door open and Trenton rushed in first. Something collided into his side, and he flopped to the tile floor, a snarling corpse on top of him. He got a hand up around the creature's neck, bracing his elbow to keep the snapping jaws at bay. More moans came from the hallway, and he waved frantically at Jay. I've got this, clear the house, he commanded. Reed slammed the door and locked it, the two of them heading quickly across the kitchen. Jay slammed the end of his pipe into the eye of a shambling zombie in the hallway, and Reed slipped past to check the living room. The duo made quick work of the bedrooms at the front of the bungalow, finding nobody else. Clear, Reed called as he emerged from the bathroom, and Jay nodded at him. Great, Trenton grunted from the kitchen. Y'all wanna come help me now? Jay's eyes widened, and he barreled back. Shit, sorry, man. He blurted as he and Reed each took an arm of the older man's attacker. They jerked it back and pinned it against the wall, holding it still so Trenton could stab it in the forehead with his machete. As he wiped the blade on the corpse's pants, Trenton waved his free hand around the large kitchen. Reed, you check in here, he instructed. I'll do the living room. Jay, you scour the bedroom closets and dressers. Just in case they have a secret stash, Jay asked. Trenton nodded. Or ammo, it's not our primary target, but damned if it isn't a close second. They split up to search the house, and the only sound was the creaks of opening cabinets and the clickety-clack of rummaging items. Within a few minutes, they reconvened in the kitchen. Not a goddamn thing in here, Reed reported as he stood up from beneath the sink. Trenton held up a half-full bottle of whiskey. Found a bottle of cheap shit by the recliner, he said. Guess the previous owner got tired of standing up for his drinks. I found a box of nine mil, no gun though, Jay said, as he stuffed the ammo into one of his side pockets. Well, it's better than nothing, Reed said with a shrug. Trenton settled his backpack on his back. Okay, let's get geared up for house number two. Chapter 10 Malcolm pulled up to the first pump about 15 feet away from the main truck stop building. They unbuckled their seat belts and got out of the dune buggy. We need to find the generator, he said, pointing around the building. Should be around the back there. Clara furrowed her brow. Aren't you going to turn this thing off? 
with as temperamental as it's being, it's best to leave it up and running, he replied, shaking his head. Last thing we need is to get it gassed up and then not be able to start it. She pursed her lips, a million concerns springing to her lips, but she bit them back. These guys were the experienced ones, not her. She was just along to help, and helping meant doing as she was told. She drew her knife and headed around the building, her new companion following behind her. Around the corner was a tall wooden privacy fence, creating a small cubby nestled right up against the wall of the truck stop. Malcolm peeked through a crack in the wood. Bingo, he said as he spotted the generator inside. He looked around, spotting a tire iron leaning up against a pile of scrap metal nearby. He picked it up and made quick work of the wooden door, prying open the lock. As the door sprang free, he handed the tire iron over to Clara. Here, you should hang on to this, he said. It'll give you a little more reach than that knife. She took it with a nod, sheathing her knife. Thanks. She turned the tire iron over in her hands a few times as he stepped into the cubby and pulled the cord on the generator a few times. It sputtered and then roared to life, drowning out the sound of the dune buggy out front. Malcolm turned back to her. We should make this quick, he yelled. I don't like how loud this thing is. Clara nodded and gave him a thumbs up instead of replying. The duo froze on the spot, breath catching as they spotted movement across the road. An old rundown trailer park stood there, and close to what looked like 80 zombies emerged from the thick of it, staggering towards the source of the noise. Malcolm tore to the pump to refuel as fast as he could, but Clara stayed rooted to the spot, mesmerized at the size of the horde lumbering towards them. This was the biggest group of zombies she'd seen so far, and she blinked slowly, her brain suddenly sluggish. She couldn't help but wonder what the hell she'd gotten herself into, if she were in over her head with these guys. Malcolm quickly popped off the gas cap and inserted the nozzle, but the trigger popped back when he tried to dispense gas. Fucking hell, he muttered, and pulled a credit card from his pocket. Even in the apocalypse, Big Brother still wanted every last cent. He entered his pin and then tried the trigger again, but still no gas. The screen on the pump flashed. Would you like a car wash today? No, I don't want a fucking car wash, Malcolm screamed and hit the decline button. Finally, the gas started to flow, and he turned a signal for Clara to run to him. As her glazed over eyes registered him, her mouth opened in a scream that he couldn't hear over the cacophony of noise around him. He didn't realize what she was saying but the intent was clear when a warm and gooey hand wrapped around his bicep. Clara leapt forward, but as Malcolm struggled with the zombie, the hose came free of the tank and spewed liquid all over the place. The gas ignited from the running dune buggy, and liquid fire bathed the ground in a freakish glow. She turned tail and quickly pounded the emergency pump shutoff button on the side of the building, and then the fire suppression button next sending a thick white cloud from the awning down onto the flames. She pressed her back against the brick wall, holding her tire iron at the ready, holding her breath as she waited for the cloud to dissipate. Malcolm, she croaked and swallowed with fear as the silhouette of a staggering corpse appeared in the smog. Two more flanked it, and then she could make out the shape of the dune buggy. Next to it, there appeared to be three shadows feasting on a fallen fourth, and a sob ripped its way out of her throat. Clara didn't have much time to think. The trailer park horde had caught her scent, and everything under the awning was fire-singed, but still dangerous. So she ran. She pumped her legs as fast as she could into the street, and made a snap decision to run under the bridge towards town. She didn't think that running for the interstate would help her, and if she ran into a horde with no cover, she'd be screwed. At least in town, she could hide as she moved. On the other side of the bridge, there were a few handfuls of corpses scattered about, moving slow. Nearby, there was a row of semi-detached houses, one end shrouded in dense tree cover. She took off as quickly as she could for that end, using the bushes to hide from any staggering dead. She hit the back door of the end house and wiggled the knob. It didn't appear to have a deadbolt, so she jammed her knife into the latch and jiggled it until the lock came free. She dove in and slammed the door behind her, 
raising her tire iron in a defensive position in case anything came at her from the dark. After a few moments of silence, she let out a deep, ragged breath and locked the door again, pressing her back against it and sinking to the floor. What the fuck was she supposed to do now? Chapter 11 Motherfucker, Reed slammed the kitchen cupboard shut in frustration. Doesn't anybody drink in this town? Jay put a hand on his shoulder in an attempt to calm him down. Dude, you need to relax, we'll find something. This is the fourth house we've searched, Reed grunted as he swatted his friend's arm away. If we don't find anything, the cartel is gonna murder us all. Trenton walked into the kitchen and leaned on the island, facing them. Jay's right, he said gently. You need to relax, man. We still have another rich person's house to hit, and we haven't even gone into town yet. Plenty of opportunity to find what we need. Besides, if we don't find anything, we can always say fuck it and just head east, Jay added, a lopsided grin breaking out on his face. It'll be like Easy Rider, just on dirt bikes, with zombies. Reed couldn't help but laugh. You know they died at the end of Easy Rider, don't you? Dude, spoilers. Jay clapped his hands over his ears, gasping dramatically. Trenton peeked out the back window. Looks like the coast is clear, let's move, he said, back to business, and the trio got ready to move. At this point, darting across the backyard and standing guard while Reed picked the neighbor's lock was routine. We're in, he hissed as the bolt clicked, and he turned the knob. An ear-splitting alarm blasted into their faces, echoing with jarring clarity through the air. What the fuck, man? Jay screamed, eyes wide. There's no fucking power. How is this thing going off? Reed rushed inside. Fuck if I know, but it is, he yelled back nearly drowned out by the bleeding alarm. Trenton shoved Jay in and motioned for them to keep their eyes open as he slammed the door behind them. They split up and ran through the house, being cautious in case of zombies, but trying to hurry to find the source of the insanely loud alarm. Trenton skidded down the side hallway and spotted the attic trap door in the ceiling. He pulled it down and hurried up the ladder, finding a car battery hooked up to a series of electronics. He grabbed a handful of wires and yanked them free, finally silencing the alarm. He let out a deep breath, ears ringing from the sudden silence, and slid down the ladder. What the hell was it? Reed asked from the other end of the hallway, speaking louder than necessary over his own ears. Fucking jury-rigged job, Trenton replied as he strode over to him, hooked it up to a car battery. Jay hollered at them from the living room staring out through the bay window overlooking the front yard. Holy fuck, man, we gotta go. We gotta go and go now, he yelled, motioning wildly to the window. Several dozen zombies emerged from the houses across the street, pouring around the corners with no sign of stopping. Jay, we need to, Trenton began, but the younger man dashed past him before he could finish, tearing for the back door. Reed made a mad grab for him, but missed. Jay, he cried and tore after his friend. Jay burst out the back door, right smack dab into a zombie on the deck. His momentum sent them tumbling down the stairs, and he let out a high-pitched scream as the ghoul sunk its teeth into his shoulder. He struggled to roll away, yelping at the feel of his flesh tearing away. He pulled out his gun and fired right into the zombie's temple, spraying brain matter across the grass. But before he could get up, Another rotting body fell on him from behind. This one bit into his throat, and he fired into its eye socket. He rolled over onto his back, expecting another zombie, but seeing only Reed staring down at him from the deck, eyes wide with fear. Jay gargled and smiled, as if telling one last joke, and then put his gun to his own head, pulling the trigger. Reed screamed in agony, leaping forward, but Trenton grabbed him around the waist and all but threw him back into the house. He slammed the door and locked it, pressing his back against it just in time for the smacking of dead hands against the window. Trenton knelt down in front of his companion, putting a hand on his shoulder. We can mourn later, but we've got to get the fuck out of here now, he said firmly. Reed nodded jerkily, swallowing hard and getting to his feet. He followed Trenton to the front window, 
watching through the bay window as the yard flooded with zombies. It was like a rotted mosh pit on the lawn, smashing up against each other to get to the house. Trenton shook his head. It would be no good trying to get out the front. He hurried to the east side bedroom, peering out the window on the side of the house. There were only a few zombies between the two structures, and he could see the street from there. The backyard was a no-go, completely swamped all the way across. He turned to Reed, whose eyes were beginning to glaze over. Trenton growled and smacked him in the back of the head. Focus, we gotta go and go now. Are you with me? Reed nodded again, blinking back tears. Yeah, he replied hoarsely and cleared his throat. Yeah. Okay, we've gotta get to the street, Trenton continued. We get out this window and run like motherfuckers. The younger man shook his head. But to where? Trenton pursed his lips for a moment and then straightened his shoulders. To the school. The school? Reed balked. It's big and there are a lot of potential exits, Trenton explained. Reed scrubbed his hands down his face and tightened his grip on the bat in his hands. Okay, good enough for me. Trenton nodded and went back to the window to make sure they still had a path. He carefully unlocked the window and eased it open as quietly as he could, the moans of the horde outside floating into them. He gave a silent countdown and then vaulted out the window, lowering his shoulder into a zombie's chest. It stumbled into two of its brethren as Reed hit the ground, and the two of them tore over the fallen trio towards the road. Hundreds of zombies flooded the street, all ambling towards the house that had been the source of the dinner bell. A few stragglers turned ahead towards the duo as they navigated the deadly obstacle course of oncoming corpses. A cluster in the middle of the road clogged up their path, and Reed held his bat out like a jousting lance and rammed it into the sternum of the lead zombie, knocking it into its pack like a set of bowling pins. The living duo leapt over the surprised fallen, tearing and ducking and weaving around sluggish zombies. As they got further from the house, the crowd thinned a bit, though more and more were turning around to pursue them. By the time they hit the school parking lot, there were at least a hundred in pursuit. Give me your bat, Trenton huffed, as Reed knelt down in front of the front door to the school. The younger man tossed it to him and got to work on the lock. Trenton turned and fainted side to side trying to cluster the two fastest zombies as they power walked towards him. His movements caused them to stumble closer to one another, so that when he crushed the first one with a bat to the skull, it tripped up the second one. Trenton took a knee and bashed the back of its head into the pavement, springing back up to his feet. You've got about ten seconds or we're gonna have to make a run for it, he said, eyeing the horde about thirty yards away. Reed grunted. Yep, he replied still digging in the lock. Trenton glanced from him to the horde, keeping watch for any quick power-walking stragglers. Six seconds. He looked to the right, mapping the best escape route around some dumpsters. Four seconds. Zombies fluttered around the left side of the building, blocking any hope of getting away on that side. Fuck, he muttered, as more swarmed the right side, leaving them completely trapped. Fifteen seconds and we're dead. He backed up next to Reed, drawing his gun. He had no desire to know what it felt like to be eaten alive, and he sure as hell was going to make sure that neither of them would ever know. The metallic click of the lock was music to his ears. Got it, Reed cried as he yanked open the door, and they pulled it closed behind them in the nick of time. They pulled it shut as the whore descended on them, banging on the double doors in frustration. Trenton locked the doors for good measure and tossed the bat back to Reed, raising his gun. Do you hear something? Reed asked, eyes wide. His companion shook his head. No, but if I do, we need to be ready, he said, moving slowly and purposefully down the hallway. All of the classroom doors were closed, and neither of them felt the need to open them. Upon finding one that was half open, Trenton covered it, while motioning for Reed to open it all the way. The room was empty, several desks overturned, and pools of blood on the floor. Reed quietly shut the door behind them, and Trenton headed for the windows, opening up the metal shutters a sliver to see outside. How's it look? Reed asked, 
keeping his voice low. Trenton shrugged as he surveyed the grassy area. Well, it looks better than what was chasing us, that's for damn sure, he murmured. His eyes widened at the sight of a large smoke plume in the distance towards the interstate. Oh, fuck me. What is it? Reed asked, swallowing hard. Trenton opened the shutter a little wider and pointed. Come take a look. Reed peered out and paled. Fucking Malcolm, man, what did he do? Let's see if we can find out, Trenton replied, and closed the shutter up tightly before pulling out his walkie-talkie. He held it up to his lips. Malcolm, Clara, either of you copy? He asked and let go of the button. There was nothing but static. Malcolm, Clara, can you hear me? He paused, pressing the radio against his forehead. He sighed and headed for the nearest desk, setting the walkie-talkie down and flopping back into the chair. Reed pulled up a chair next to him. Keep the faith, man, they could just be avoiding zombies like we were, he said, though his voice sounded desperate in his own ears. Here's hoping, Trenton replied, scratching the back of his head. There was a moment of silence and Reed leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees. Do you think the cartel will really wipe out the town if we don't get back with something? Trenton took a deep breath. I don't know, he admitted, but at the moment, my only concern is finding a way out of this shit. Chapter 12 Rogers thrummed his fingers on the table, staring at the military laptop. The screen simply read, connecting in green letters on a black screen. Does it usually take this long to connect? He asked. Leon nodded. Unfortunately, yeah. I've only been able to tap into one satellite, and it has a 90-minute clock to circle the globe, he explained. When I do get it, we'll only have in-range imagery for about five minutes. I mean, I could tap into another one, but I really don't want to draw attention to myself. I'm assuming there's a functional government working somewhere and would rather them not getting upset with me. I can understand that, Rogers agreed, and then perked up as a loading bar appeared on the screen and began to rapidly fill. About damn time, Leon muttered. Let's see what we can see. The screen flickered and then went live, showing a top-down view of South Texas. Leon began typing to zoom in, centering on El Paso. Look at City Hall, Rogers said, leaning over his shoulder. That's where they said they were setting up. Leon tapped a few more keys. One trip to City Hall coming right up. The screen focused in on City Hall, showing dozens of people moving around on the street. What the fuck are they doing? He furrowed his brow. Looks like they're playing tag. Roger squinted and pointed to a few figures carrying something big and white across the street to a telephone pole. Looks like they're setting up for a party. Shit. Leon shook his head in disbelief. No wonder they have us out here risking our lives for booze. The detective nodded. It's really a shame this thing doesn't have drone strike capability. Well, if we can ever get into Fort Bliss, I might be able to make that a reality. Leon chuckled. Rogers blinked at him. Good to know, he replied, impressed. Okay, well, this ain't doing us a whole hell of a lot of good, Leon said with a sigh. Where are your boys at? A town called Van Horn, the detective replied. It's about 90 miles east on the I-10. Can't miss it, as it's the biggest piece of civilization on that route. Leon clicked away at the keyboard again. All right, let's take a trip. As he zoomed in on the town in question, they noticed a large smoke plume rising from the south of the city. That can't be good. No, no, it can't, Rogers agreed, blinking rapidly. I mean, maybe they did that as a diversion? He put a hand to his jaw as he took in the zombie horde on the north side of the city. The two men stared at the screen in mild shock for a few moments, barely blinking when the screen went black. Satellite out of range, scrawled across the black monitor. Rogers took a deep breath and straightened up. Leon, I know we just met, he said firmly, but I have a huge favor to ask of you. The tone of your voice makes it sound like you about to ask something that's gonna make my black ass hitchhike out of here, Leon said as he leaned back in his chair. The detective took a deep breath. It doesn't look like our scouts are gonna make it back. 
He licked his lips and crossed his arms. So when the cartel comes, I'm gonna need you to pose as the town's leader. Leon closed the laptop and stood up, shoving cables back into his duffel bag. Man, it's been a boatload of fun, but I'm gonna get on up out of here. I'm serious, Rogers insisted. And I'm serious too, motherfucker, Leon snapped. Why in the hell would I wanna act like this town's leader? You want me to get shot in the fucking face? Why don't you man the fuck up and do it your damn self? Because I'm supposed to be dead, the detective replied, pointing to the bandage on the side of his head. Rodriguez, the second in command of the Rivas cartel, did this to me in order to save my life. There are others in the cartel who think I'm dead. If they see me alive, they'll butcher this town on principle. Leon stalked to the window and all but ripped it open, pulling his solar panel back inside. So why the fuck should I stay then? Rogers shrugged and let out a bitter laugh. Because dying in a group is better than dying alone? The taller man took a deep breath as he stuffed the equipment back into his bag, zipping it up with an air of finality. He scrubbed his hands down his face and turned on the detective. Why me, he demanded. Surely there is somebody else who can do it. Most of the people in this town were exiled out of El Paso, Rogers explained. Deemed useless and a waste of resources by the cartel. If one of them steps up to speak for us, they're not going to be taken seriously. You, on the other hand, being military intelligence, would make it seem like there is competent leadership here. Leon sighed. Well, based on our current conversation, it would be nice to have the appearance of competency in this town. They shared a chuckle, diffusing the moment a bit, and Roger stared up at him, hope in his eyes. Leon scoffed and shook his head. Okay, he held up a hand. I'll do it, on one condition. Anything, Rogers replied quickly. Leon puffed his chest out. From here on out, you call me Mayor Leon. The detective burst into laughter, the stress of the day suddenly bubbling over into the only thing he could do. He held his gut as Leon clapped him on the back to make sure he was all right, and finally straightened up, gasping for breath. Rogers shook his head and wiped a tear from his eye. You got it, Mayor. Chapter 13 Rodriguez pointed to an area due east of the city, but before he could open his mouth to explain, one of the cartel members stepped forward. Sir, if I may, he began. I spent a lot of time on this side of the border before this, and that area you want us to explore is vacant. Rodriguez internally rolled his eyes, but schooled his expression into a glare and turned to the younger man. Are you questioning my judgment? The cartel member gulped. No, no, sir, he stammered. It's just, my cousins and I used to go dirt biking out there, so I speak from experience. I know you have a difficult job to do, and I just want to help in any way I can. Well, fuck, Rodriguez thought, realizing that he had no way out of this without raising suspicion. He sighed and turned to the group fully. Thank you for your input, he said, crossing his arms. I tell you what, you and your men have been working hard for me. Go get some food, put your feet up, and come back to me in an hour, and I'll have a new destination for you. Thank you, sir, the cartel member replied, grinning in relief. The group hurried to leave, and Rodriguez assumed they were eager to use every second of their restful hour. Angel Rivas strolled in past the bustling group and sneered at the older man. Rodriguez. He drew out the name as if he were testing it in his mouth. Still sending our men out on wild chases, I see. Just being thorough, Rodriguez replied with a flippant sigh. Something you were never good at, which explains why I'm in charge and you're not. Angel smirked. Well, we'll see about that, he said and snapped his fingers. His superior lost all color in his face, not liking the smug look. His stomach dropped like a stone as Hector shoved Francisco into the room and onto the floor, bound and bloodied. What the fuck? Rodriguez roared. How dare you do this to one of my men? Your men? Angel sneered. Oh, so they're your men now. I'm guessing that's going to be news to my father. The older man stalked forward, inches from the cartel leader's son's nose. You speak to me like that again, and the next words out of your mouth will be coated in your blood. 
Angel's smug expression didn't falter, and he simply stepped away from his fuming opponent and kicked Francisco in the stomach. The bound man let out a hoof and a groan of pain, unable to even rise to his knees from the beating it looked like he'd endured. Rodriguez stepped forward, shoulders squaring, but Angel drew a massive handgun. He cocked his head, as well as the gun. You need to sit down, he demanded, and watched with glee in his eyes as the man that had been his superior sank slowly into a chair. That's it, sit down like a good little puppy. Rodriguez clenched his fists. I demand to know the meaning of this. I caught him stealing weapons from the armory, Juan Pablo announced from the front door. You dense motherfucker, he has armory clearance, Rodriguez snapped. He has the right to get whatever he wants. Juan Pablo pushed off of the doorframe, strolling forward with his hands clasped behind his back. But not for whomever he wants, he drawled. Rodriguez schooled his expression, but beneath his heart pounded, and there was a massive knot in his throat. He didn't like this situation at all. They could be well and properly fucked. You see, I was at the southeast checkpoint when he came back this morning, Juan Pablo explained as he paced back and forth. He was acting, shall we say, suspicious. So I had my friend Hector here take a joyride down the I-10. He motioned to the man standing proudly behind the hissing Francisco. Hector, would you like to tell our friend here what you found? Rodriguez closed his eyes, taking a deep, calming breath. They were well and properly fucked. Hector grinned. Fabens. And they brought this information to me, Angel cut in, sounding positively chipper. Which cleared up why you kept sending our men to areas we know contained nothing of value. Rodriguez opened his eyes and shrugged as if he hadn't a care in the world. So, what are you going to do, shoot me? Angel shook his head, the curl of his lips animalistic. Not unless I have to, he cooed. I wouldn't want to rob my father of one of his favorite pastimes. Juan Pablo spread his arms dramatically. Hector, if you'd be so kind as to assist Mr. Rodriguez to his feet, he grinned. We're going to pay Diago Rivas a visit. Chapter 14 Hector pressed the barrel of his rifle against the back of Rodriguez's neck until he reached up and rapped on Tiago's office door. A bodyguard cracked the door, peering down his nose at the group. Who is it? The cartel leader's voice carried from inside. The bodyguard surveyed the motley crew in front of him. Rodriguez, your son, and a few others, he replied, sounding almost bored. Oh, I didn't realize the party was starting in my office today. Tiago replied and clucked his tongue. Very well, send them in. The bodyguard opened the door wide, stepping aside. Angel swept past Hector, who held Rodriguez at arm's length by the collar. Juan Pablo dumped Francisco onto the floor, leaning against the wall and crossing his legs at the ankle. Tiago looked up from cutting his steak, and his eyes nearly bugged out of his head. He shoved his chair back and glared at his son. Angel, have you lost your mind? He demanded. What are you doing leading my second in command around like a dog? His son raised his chin. Juan Pablo and I caught Rodriguez and this piece of shit, organizing a resistance movement against you. Rodriguez scoffed and rolled his eyes. Tiago pursed his lips, reaching down for his silk napkin. He dabbed daintily at his mouth and then skirted his desk, stalking over to his second in command. He raised an eyebrow. A resistance movement? He asked, voice level. Rodriguez shrugged, trying to seem casual, though his heart throttled his chest. Hardly. Then explain yourself, Tiago said with a wave of his hand, against these serious accusations. His second took a deep breath. In the town of Fabens, I set up a safe haven for the undesirables who are expelled from the city. They are of no threat to you or any of us. Tiago clucked his tongue and turned to his desk, lifting his glass of fine tequila and swirling it. So who am I to believe? My son? or my second in command. He downed the glass and then pulled out his gold-plated handgun, whipping around wide-eyed. You two have always butted heads, but I thought you could work through it like mature fucking adults. Apparently I was wrong. 
he raised the gun to his second's forehead. Wait, Francisco cried, scrambling to his knees as best he could. Tiago laughed at the state of the man and leaned over to accentuate how much lower his beaten subordinate was. Oh, you wish to say something? Fabens was my doing, Francisco said, voice hoarse with pain. Your doing. Tiago threw his hands up with mock exasperation. And why would you think that was a good idea? I, Francisco gasped and then cleared his throat, catching his breath. I thought that putting the undesirables to work, venturing out into the infected areas to retrieve supplies was worthwhile. They risk their lives and we reap the benefits, costing us nothing. Juan Pablo snorted, raising his hand. Then what about the weapons you were stealing? You were stealing weapons? Tiago snarled. To give to those people? A few rifles and handguns, nothing that would pose a threat to us. The beaten man insisted. Just something to help them get what we need. Enough, Rodriguez cut in, glaring down at his friend. Francisco is attempting to cover for me. Fabens was my idea, and he was just following orders. Tiago barked a few choice Spanish words, and then turned back to his second, tapping the barrel of his gun against his temple. Why would you betray me like this? He asked, voice rising in pitch and volume. After everything I've done for you, everything I've done for your family. We have a lot of territory to hold, and our manpower isn't going to be increasing, Rodriguez replied, battling to keep his voice steady. And as your second in command, it's my duty to make sure we have the things we need to withstand any threat. Tiago narrowed his eyes. And you thought that sneaking people out of the city was the way to do that? These people were discarded. Rodriguez insisted. I found a use for them. Think of it like a human recycling program. The cartel boss laughed, lowering his gun hand and resting a hand on his stomach. That's a good one, human recycling. He paced slowly to Francisco, like a lion stalking its prey. So, you were just following orders, huh? Yes, the beaten man stammered. Yes, sir. And why did you follow his orders? Tiago asked. Francisco swayed back and forth on his knees. Because I'm loyal, sir. Oh, you're loyal, the cartel leader sneered, and Rodriguez's heart skipped a beat at how similar his son resembled him in that moment. Loyal, Tiago stepped back, tapping his handgun on his thigh. So you're loyal to Rodriguez, then? Yes, sir, Francisco gasped. I'm, I'm loyal. Tiago's eyes hardened. You're supposed to be loyal to me, he roared, and fired his gun, putting a bullet in the broken man's gut. You're not supposed to be loyal to anyone else, only me. He fired three more times into the moaning man, and then took a deep breath, running a hand over his hair before turning to his second. We're going to take a field trip down to your little pet project, he said, voice smooth as silk once again. If it has borne fruit, you may yet live to see another sunrise. If it has not, then you will wish you met his fate. He motioned to Francisco, who bled out on the floor, twitching. Rodriguez blinked down at his friend, trying not to show his emotions, but inside he screamed and thrashed, with each ounce of the life draining from Francisco's body. Juan Pablo, get the car, Tiago barked, and get someone in here to deal with this mess. I want this cleaned up and this piece of shit traitor hanging from a lamppost by the time I get back. Juan Pablo nodded and headed for the door. Yes, sir. Tiago holstered his golden gun and skirted his desk, sitting down to resume eating his steak as if he hadn't been interrupted in the first place. Chapter 15 Clara rose up onto her knees and peeked out the window, surprised that the horde hadn't come knocking for her yet. There were a smattering of zombies roaming about, but nothing even close to the crowd that had swarmed around the truck stop. She let out a deep sigh of relief and then glanced at the kitchen. Well, if I'm here, I might as well see if I can find what we need, she muttered and got to her feet. She bounced on her toes for a moment to loosen up her joints and then headed for the cupboards, opening and closing every one. She found a handful of canned goods and an open bag of chips that was more ants than chips. The pantry and the fridge also stood empty, and even the freezer had been picked clean. 
She slammed the door shut in frustration, and then paused at the sight of a flyer stuck to it with a University of Texas magnet. 20% off liquor sale, the flyer boasted, and Clara ripped the paper free. She stared at the picture of an unmarked building, no big advertising, just a small handwritten sign in the window. She closed her eyes. Son of a bitch, she breathed. They'd passed that building on their way into town. It was one of the first ones they'd come across on the outskirts. She reached for her walkie-talkie and hit the button to speak. There was no sound, not even static, and she examined the device. It was powered off. Good job there, Malcolm, she muttered. Dumbass. She paused and shook her head, berating herself for making fun of a dead man. She hadn't known him well, and he hadn't been the brightest bulb in the box, but he deserved her respect. She took a deep breath and powered the radio on, turning it to channel 13 and whispering a quiet prayer to whatever deity would listen before pressing the talk button. Trenton, she said firmly and clearly. Trenton, are you there? It's Clara. She held her breath as she waited for a few tense moments. Clara, Trenton came back, voice bursting with excitement. You're alive. Is Malcolm with you? We saw smoke coming from the truck stop. He's, he's gone, she replied. So is the dune buggy. Ah, uh, came the somber reply. Are you okay? I'm a little scared, but I'll live, Clara assured him. There was a moment of quiet, and then another click. Where are you? I'm in some small house just north of the interstate, she said. Are you able to get out? It looks like it, she said, heading back to the window to double check. There's only a handful of those things around. Okay, Trenton said quickly, voice like stone. I want you to get back to the interstate and head back towards Fabens. About ten miles up the road is a town called Alamore. Go north, and you'll find a safe house we set up. Food, water, everything you'll need to be comfortable for a while. Reed and I will meet you there when we can. I have a better idea, Clara cut in. I figured out where the liquor store is. You did? How? Trenton blurted. Wait, forget that. I don't care. Where is it? You're not going to believe this, but it's one of the first buildings we passed when we came into town, she replied, scrubbing a hand down her face in frustration. It's a small concrete building with a handwritten sign in the window. That's why we missed it. Fuck, fuck, Trenton barked. Fuck. Are you okay? Clara asked immediately. What happened? She imagined the guys being gored by zombies. Trenton, what's going on? I fucked up, that's what's going on, he moaned. I fucked up and two people died. She calmed down, realizing he was beating himself up, and shook her head. Hey, it's not your fault, we all missed it. She decided not to ask about Jay, whom she assumed had fallen given the fact that he said two people died, and mentioned he and Reed would meet up with her. Yeah, well, you all weren't in charge. Trenton said quietly. Well, don't make their deaths be in vain, Clara insisted. We have a chance to protect Fabens, so let's figure out how to do it. There was a quiet moment, and she hoped that Reed was comforting him proper on the other end. You're right, Trenton finally said. Okay, how do we do this? How? I got it, I think. Can you get to the liquor store? Clara peered out the window again. I think so. I can see the main road, and it's just like a mile or so run to get to the store. Okay, get there as quickly as you can, he instructed. Get in, find what we need, and sit tight. Reed and I will take care of finding transportation. We will come get you. Her heart leapt for the first time since she'd left El Paso. Is this what hope feels like? Okay, I'll radio you when I'm in. Be safe, Trenton said firmly. Over and out. Clara pocketed the walkie-talkie and checked her weapons, making sure her gun was loaded and accessible. She gripped her tire iron, knowing it would be her best bet to stay as quiet as possible. She watched the zombies from the door's window, taking a deep breath. Don't think, just go, she muttered to herself, bouncing on the balls of her feet. Go now, this is just like any other run. Go as fast as you can and don't look back. She took a deep, steadying breath and then threw open the door, darting outside. She flew past two zombies, 
before they could even register her presence and ducked under the clawing arms of a third. The last one in the yard managed to catch her shirt on the way by, and she stifled a scream as she spun around. She smashed the tire iron down on the ghoul's wrist, shattering it into pieces and sending the frustrated zombie staggering back. She tore free and took off running to the road, too afraid to look over her shoulder to see how far away the quartet of corpses were. Don't look, just run, she huffed as her legs pumped against the ground. You're faster than they are, they can't catch you. She focused on her path along the road, even as moans grew louder behind her. They straggled up onto the pavement from the shoulders, and she zigzagged as fast as she could across the lanes to avoid them. Stopping to fight would be death. She needed to keep moving. Clara reached the parking lot of the liquor store as her calves began to scream in agony and jerked hard on the front door. It was locked. Shit, she muttered. At this point, she finally turned around, eyes widening at the sight of the horde that had gathered to stagger up the road. Even at a hundred yards away, it was an intimidating sight, and she fought the panic rising up in her throat. Shit! She turned and yanked on the door again, though her rational brain knew it was futile. Fuck it, she grunted, and took a step back from the door, drawing her revolver. This definitely counted as an emergency, and since she already had the attention of almost a hundred zombies, it didn't really matter how much noise she made. She aimed at the latch, turned her head away, and fired. The door fell open, the wood falling away, and she tore inside, pulling it shut behind her. Having completely destroyed the latch, Clara looked around wildly for something to hold the door closed. She spotted a string of Christmas lights in the window and ripped them down, wrapping the cord around the doorknob several times. She pulled it taut, testing the strength, and then stretched it out and tied it around the leg of a heavy metal shelf nearby. She plucked the cord to make sure it was secure. If somebody were to pull hard on that door, it was likely that the whole thing would come free, but she had no other options and hoped that the zombies wouldn't be that smart. They tended to just bang on stuff, not pull open doors. Clara ran behind the front counter, scanning the back wall for anything worthy of the cartel boss. She clambered up onto the counter to reach the top shelf, finding a mini case of tequila priced at $250 per bottle. She raised an eyebrow as she pulled it down. Hopefully that's retail and not an insane markup, she said, shaking her head. The bottles were dusty, but intact. As her feet hit the floor, the thunder of zombie hands smacking the front of the building made her heart leap into her throat. The moaning permeated the walls, and she froze stock still, waiting to see if the Christmas lights would hold. When the door stayed put, Clara lifted her walkie-talkie to her lips. Trenton, I found it. That's great, he replied immediately, the sound of an engine in the background. Sit tight, we're headed your way. She took a deep breath and pocketed the radio, wincing as the windows rattled in their frames under the violent hunger of the creatures outside. Not going anywhere. Chapter 16 You got anything? Trenton called across the classroom as he peered out one of the windows. Reed made a noise of dissatisfaction. Not seeing shit, man. All right, Trenton replied with a sigh, heading for the door. Let's try across the hall. They crept across to the closest door across the way, pausing with their weapons at the ready. Reed gripped the knob and then threw the door open, allowing his companion to rush in, machete raised. It's clear, Trenton declared and headed for the window as the door gave a soft click behind him. They scanned the zombie-filled landscape, dozens of corpses staggering around the main parking lot. Holy shit, Reed said, pointing. I think I got something. Look at the far end there. Trenton shifted his focus to the side his friend surveyed and honed in on a bright cherry red extended cab pickup truck. You have any idea how to hotwire a truck? Afraid picking locks was as far as I got in my criminal career, Reed admitted. His companion rubbed his chin. What are the odds the keys are in the building? Let me see those binoculars, Reed said, holding out his hand. He raised them to his face and scrutinized the truck, 
seeing a few plastic barrels in the back full of basketballs and soccer balls. There was a pile of baseball bats and some other sports equipment. Check it out, he said, handing the binoculars back over. Either that's the PE teacher's truck, or somebody was stealing equipment. Trenton nodded as he lowered the device, shoving them back into his belt. To the gym, he declared, and they headed out of the classroom. They were cautious but brisk as they headed down the hallway, easily finding the double doors of the gymnasium. A thick metal chain held them shut with a lock. Reed grunted as he inspected the lock, realizing it was a combination instead of a key. Fuck, he dropped it and shook his head. Trenton motioned to the sign for the locker room. Hey, Reed, let's hit the showers, he said, and headed around the corner. The duo quickly ducked back around at the sight of two zombies banging on the door to the locker room. Trenton did a silent countdown, and they crept up behind the corpses until they were within arm's reach and struck in unison. The zombies crumpled to the floor without so much as an extra groan to alert anyone of their presence. Looks like they were after somebody, Trenton said, as he wiped his blade clean on one of the fallen creature's shirts. Reed pushed against the door and met resistance. He pushed a little harder, whatever was bracing it from the other side, giving a squeaking noise as he managed to shove it across the tiles. Definitely after somebody, he grunted, pushing harder. Trenton helped him, and they managed to get it open wide enough for Reed to slip through. The offending item blocking the door was a metal desk, and Reed wrapped his hands around it to move it out of the way enough so that Trenton could follow him in. He turned at the sound of shuffling feet, and his eyes widened at the sight of a large zombie staggering out of the locker area. It looked like at one time he may have been a bodybuilder with broad shoulders and a thick neck. Now he just looked like Swiss cheese, missing large chunks out of his enormous biceps. Before Reed could react, the gigantic zombie crashed into him, slamming them both back against the concrete wall. Fuck, fuck, fuck! Reed screamed, pushing up against the corpse's chest to try to keep its snapping jaws away from his tender flesh. Trenton managed to wriggle just far enough through the door and brought the machete down into the thing's head. It stuck halfway, but far enough to sever the brain, causing the zombie to slump forward. You okay? Trenton asked. Reed grunted and heaved the heavy body off of him, throwing his arm over his eyes to catch his breath. Y yeah. Holy fuck, that was close, man. Trenton let out a relieved laugh, scratching the back of his head. His companion shook his head and couldn't help but huff his own laugh. Next door we come across, you're going in first. That's a deal, Trenton replied, reaching down to help his friend to a standing. Reed finally got up, liberating the machete from the corpse and handing it back through the door before finally shoving the metal desk clear. He slowly made his way through the locker room as Trenton patted down the attacking corpse. We're clear, Reed called. Trenton shook his head and walked into the main locker area. No keys, he reported, and they both fixated on an open door in the corner. Maybe the office, he suggested, and they wandered in. Trenton rummaged through the desk drawers while Reed checked the filing cabinet, chuckling at the sight of a hidden bottle of scotch in there. 18-year-old scotch, he said, pulling it out and giving it a wiggle. Trenton shook his head. Here's a man who took his alcoholism seriously. Yeah, I can respect that, Reed said. His companion opened the last drawer, and the jangling of metal made both of them hold their breath. Trenton grinned, reaching in for a key ring. The black car key matched the brand of the truck. Looks like we're in business, he said, and shoved them deep into his pocket. They headed out of the locker room, reinspecting the hallway before heading quickly to the back exit of the building. Is this the right door? Reed asked. Trenton scratched the back of his head. I think it's the closest one to the truck, but let's see how bad it looks. He gently pushed on the metal release bar, ever so slowly opening the door a hair's breadth so he could get a good view of the parking lot. Zombies staggered about, but the first ten feet or so out the door was pretty clear and most of them were spread out instead of in groups. He carefully and silently closed the door again. So, you want the good news or the bad news first? He asked, trying to sound cheerful. Reed rolled his eyes. When the fuck did we start getting good news today? Fair enough, Trenton chuckled. Okay, there's enough room to get the doors open, and for us to get up ahead of steam. Reed raised an eyebrow. But? 
But there's like a hundred zombies between us and the truck, Trenton finished. His companion let out a deep whoosh of breath. Fantastic. Just channel your football days, put your head down, and run like a motherfucker, Trenton instructed. Reed couldn't help but laugh, scrubbing his hands down his face. Not loving this plan. Yeah, me either, but it's the best we've got, his friend replied with a helpless shrug. He put his hand on the release bar. Ready? On three. One, two, three. He flung the door open and they burst into the parking lot. The sound of the metal door coupled with the quick movement drew the attention of every zombie within earshot and they all turned towards the source. Trenton led the charge, crashing apart two zombies that were close together, sending them stumbling back into a domino effect against other corpses. He continued like a lead blocker, clearing the path for his running back, Reed hot on his heels. The surrounding zombies began to swarm around the disturbance, and the two men ducked, bobbed, and wove through a sea of rotting flesh and grasping hands. Trenton kept his eyes on the truck, that cherry red beacon of hope, trying to ignore the cold, dead fingers brushing every inch of his flesh as he flew past them. As they managed to break free of the thick of the horde, the truck was about 20 yards away, and Trenton mashed the unlock button on the key fob. Nothing happened. Fuck, it's not unlocking, he screamed. Keep trying, Reed huffed from behind him. Trenton hit it over and over, but still the truck stayed silent. As they reached the doors, they jerked on each handle, but everything remained shut tight. Christ, do we even have the right keys? Reed cried, voice carrying a panicked edge. I fucking hope so. Trenton fumbled to switch to the actual key, but when he tried to shove it into the lock, he found a wad of dried bubblegum had been shoved into it. Are you fucking kidding me? He cursed and looked over his shoulder at the horde that was only 10 yards away. Into the truck bed, he yelled. The duo jumped up into the back, using the tires for leverage, and flung themselves to relative safety just as the wave of zombies reached them. The key didn't work? Reed asked as they backed up into the center of the truck bed, back to back to avoid the reaching hands. Trenton shook his head. Fucking prankster shoved gum in the lock. God only knows how long it's been like that. No wonder the coach drank, Reed quipped as he smacked the arm of an overzealous zombie with his bat. Trenton reached down and grabbed one of the baseball bats from the equipment cages and smashed it a few times against the back window of the cab, finally shattering it all over the back seats. He ducked inside, careful not to catch on any of the jagged glass, and slid into the driver's seat. Oh, you'd better fucking work, he muttered, and slid the key into the ignition. He turned it, and the engine sparked to life, the satisfying rumble of a working vehicle, like music to his ears. We have life, get in, he called back. Reed dove inside, taking up a defensive position in the back window. Don't gotta ask me twice, he declared. Trenton popped the truck into gear and punched the accelerator, flattening several zombies as he peeled out of the parking lot. His walkie-talkie crackled, and then Clara's voice came through. Trenton, I found it. Relief washed over him. That's great, sit tight, we're headed your way. Hope burned in his chest. They might just have a chance. Chapter 17 Clara leaned up against the front counter, staring at her makeshift door lock. She couldn't help but imagine it breaking, a hundred zombies flooding in to tear her flesh from her bones with their teeth. She shuddered, fingering the stock of the revolver secured to her side. Clara, you still with us? Trenton's voice through the walkie-talkie broke her morbid thoughts, and she immediately raised it to her lips. Yep, just me and a hundred of my closest friends, Clara replied dryly. Yeah, we can see that, Trenton replied. We're about a hundred yards away on the frontage road. You certainly know how to draw a crowd. She sighed. Any idea on how to get me out of here? There are too many for us to drive through, so we're gonna have to lure them away, he explained. She took a deep breath, picking at the hem of her tank top. You're gonna have to take them in the direction of Fabens, because there's another whore down by the truck stop. Wouldn't be good if you ran into them. Yeah, no kidding, Trenton came back. Okay, we're gonna do a drive-by and see if we can't get them onto the frontage road. Sit tight and just be ready to move, because we may not have much of a window. 
She jumped down from the counter and gripped the six-pack of tequila tightly. I'll be ready, she promised, and shoved the radio back into her pocket. Trenton popped the truck into gear and drove slowly up the road towards the liquor store. The tiny building was buried in a plethora of zombies at least 20 deep. He turned and backed up so that the bed faced the horde and then laid hard on the horn. The loud bleat got every creature's attention easily, and the mass of rotted heads turned, mouths open in excited moans as they ambled towards the truck. Well, that worked pretty well, Reed said. Trenton moved the truck forward at a snail's pace so that he wouldn't outrun the staggering zombies. Let's hope so, he said. Reed peered over top of the heads, scoping out the store. Shit, he muttered. There's still about 20 of them around the store. We can deal with that, Trenton declared. Are the rest still following us? His passenger nodded. Yep, you're still the zombie pied piper. Let's get him down the road a little bit, Trenton said, and led the throng about a half a mile before punching the gas. He sped towards the next interstate ramp and then did a quick 180, screaming back down the freeway towards the liquor store. He got off just before, stopping in the middle of the road about 50 yards away. What are you thinking? Reed raised an eyebrow. I'm thinking curbside pickup, Trenton replied, inclining his head to the passenger door. What kind of wingspan does that door have? His companion opened the door wide and then slammed it shut with a shrug. Five feet, maybe, he said. I can work with that, Trenton declared, and put the radio to his mouth. Clara, do you copy? Clara tightened her grip on the tequila and lifted the radio to her mouth. I'm here. Which way does the front door open? Trenton asked. Um, she replied, brow furrowing. It opens outwards, why? There was a pause. Okay, this is going to sound crazy, but when I tell you to, I need you to open the door for me. She almost dropped the alcohol in her shock and stared at the walkie-talkie as if it had offended her. Uh, yeah, that does sound crazy, she said. You got any particular reason, or do you just like to challenge me? We've got to get as close as we can to the building to shield you from the zombies still outside, Trenton explained. We have to be five feet away from the building in order to get our door open. Clara nodded, finally grasping the idea. Yeah, yeah, I'm tracking. You have bullets left? He asked. Five shots, she replied. Okay, you get that door open and shoot whatever you need to shoot, he instructed. She barked a laugh. Thanks for the permission, but that wasn't going to be an issue. Fair enough, he replied with a chuckle. You let me know when you're ready. Clara walked over to the door and unwrapped her Christmas light lock, holding the knob tightly to keep the door shut. I'm ready, she said into the radio. You just tell me when. She shoved the walkie-talkie back into her pocket and tightened her hand around her gun. She heard squealing tires outside and the roar of an engine growing closer. Now, Trenton's voice echoed in her pocket. Clara threw the door open and then took a step back, firing carefully into the closest zombie's face. Its forehead exploded onto its brethren, a trio of creatures that rushed forward to take its place, ambling through the door. The truck smashed over the rest of the group, taking the front door right off of its hinges. Clara dove behind the counter, putting a hard surface between her and her pursuers. She took her time aiming her weapon, acutely aware of how little shots she really had to get this right. She dropped first one, then two zombies, and as the third hit the counter and opened its mouth to scream, she put a bullet point-blank into its eye socket. She didn't waste any time darting around to the door, rushing towards the truck with the alcohol in hand. Reed stood against the passenger door, firing at the zombies wedged against the other side. Clara lunged forward, shoving the case of tequila across to the middle seat before clambering up herself. Reed immediately slid down into the passenger seat and slammed the door. Go, 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 he cried, and Trenton hit the gas for all he was worth. Once they were back on the frontage road, heading towards the entrance ramp, the three shell-shocked civilians stayed silent. It was Reed that broke the quiet, spotting the horde they'd led away, still ambling after a long-escaped target. Christ, they're still walking, he breathed. Clara swallowed hard. We're going to have to keep an eye on that. She crossed her arms, 
happy to be in the presence of live human beings. First things first, Trenton said hoarsely, nodding to the box of liquid gold at Reed's feet. We have to get that tequila back to town. Not going to have anything to protect unless the cartel is happy with us. Chapter 18 Man, that's one hell of a haul to get to, Leon said and let out a low whistle. Roger shrugged as he circled a few more places on the large map on the table. Pretty much everywhere is going to be a hell of a haul from where we are. This is true, Leon replied. The detective inclined his head towards the duffel bags. How detailed can that satellite get, he asked. If I push it? Leon pursed his lips and shrugged. I can get down to 20 feet above ground level. I mean, we ain't gonna be able to look in stores or nothing, but we can at least scout out hordes. The loud bleat of an air horn sliced through the air, and the two men straightened up. Rogers turned to his new companion. If we survive the day, that'll be useful, he said, and then patted him on the back. Are you up for this? Don't worry, man, I got you, Leon replied, offering him a reassuring smile. I spent half my career learning how to please the higher-ups who viewed me as disposable. The detective chuckled humorlessly. Given that we are very disposable in their eyes, that experience is going to come in handy. Any last bit of advice? Leon asked. Rogers grinned. Cover your ears. He motioned to the bandage on the side of his head and then turned on his heel to head to one of the back offices to hide. Leon chuckled and shook his head, heading outside. The air horn stopped their incessant noise, and he watched a half dozen heavily armed men, creating a perimeter on the main drag around three black SUVs. He took a deep breath and headed towards the cluster as a group of well-dressed men stepped out of the middle vehicle. You, a tall man pointed at Leon as he approached. Are you the man in charge of this, whatever the hell it is? He waved his hand around above his head. Yep, Leon replied, crossing his arms. And who might you be? I am Tiago Rivas, head of the Rivas Cartel and the current ruler of El Paso. The man declared, his back ramrod straight. Leon raised an eyebrow. Ruler of El Paso, he asked. I wasn't aware we had elected a king. Kings are not elected, my friend, Tiago said, wagging a gold-adorned finger. They seize power when the opportunity presents itself. I saw my opportunity, and I took it. Leon gently clapped his hands together, as if applauding a good putt. Well, congratulations. Tiago's eyes darkened. You would be wise to show me respect. Respect is earned, the self-proclaimed leader of Fabens shot back. So far, you haven't earned a goddamn thing. The cartel leader laughed. Fine, if this is the way you want to go about things, I will happily oblige. He drew his shiny handgun and aimed it at Leon's forehead, his opponent not even flinching with the movement. You have ten seconds to tell me why I shouldn't kill you and everyone in this town. Leon shrugged casually. Because we can do things your people can't do. Like what? Tiago sneered. Go out into the wasteland and get supplies? I have an army of people who do my bidding at my command. Leon nodded. That may be true, but I can guarantee they don't have satellite surveillance. Tiago pursed his lips and lowered his gun, contemplating. Angel growled, stepping up beside his father. Just shoot him and take his shit, he demanded. We got people who can run it. Not without the codes that are in here, Leon sing-songed, tapping his temple. You touch me or anybody in this town, and I'll punch my own ticket, and you boys get nothing. Now, I don't know who the fuck you are, but you need to sit your happy ass down and let the grown-ups continue talking. Angel snarled. How dare you speak to the son of- Oh, he's your father, Leon cut in, eyebrows rising to his hairline. Well, if you take another step closer to me, I'm gonna make you call me daddy. Now sit your punk ass down before I embarrass you in front of your friends and family. Angel reached for his knife, but his father smacked him in the arm. Enough, he snapped. Back to the truck. His son scowled, glaring daggers at Leon, who simply winked and blew him a kiss. Angel stormed back to the truck, slamming the door extra hard behind him. In the distance, headlights appeared over the horizon, and Tiago raised an eyebrow as his guards turned on high alert. Friends of yours? he asked. Leon nodded. 
scouts who were out in the wastes, collecting stuff for you. So my tribute has arrived, Tiago declared, spreading his arms. Trenton got out of the car, carrying the case of tequila, and slowly moved past the guards, setting the box directly at the feet of the cartel boss. Tiago's eyes lit up at the color of the caps, and he pulled a bottle out to examine it. This, he said as he tapped on the label, is some fantastic stuff. Where did you get this? Couple of hours down the road, Trenton replied stiffly. Cost us quite a bit, too. The cartel boss returned a bottle to the case and raised a hand, palm out. Tell me, how much? Three people's lives, three dirt bikes, and a dune buggy, all of which were our main modes of transportation, Trenton replied flatly. Tiago chuckled and turned to rove his eyes over his companions. These people are willing to sacrifice themselves so I can get drunk, he declared. Rodriguez, you have set up a fine source of entertainment for me. Rodriguez shifted his weight as the cartel boss continued to laugh over the situation. Trenton clenched his jaw, and Leon nodded gently at him for reassurance. Juan Pablo, Tiago finally said, first thing tomorrow I want you to deliver half a dozen bikes to them, grant them access to the gas station on the south end of town. Hell, give them some weapons too. As long as it benefits me, what are a few guns and bullets? Juan Pablo nodded. Yes, sir. Tiago turned back to Leon and stared down his nose. Let me be very clear, he said, voice low and menacing. While I do find this whole situation amusing, the moment you stop being useful to me, I will burn this town to the ground with everyone inside of it. I will make you watch as the people you protect burn alive. Are we clear? Crystal. Leon stood still as a statue. Tiago patted him on the cheek. I'll expect something from you very soon. He grinned and walked off, waving his hand above his head to get the guards moving back to the trucks. Let's go, I have some tequila to drink. On his way past Rodriguez, he lowered his voice to a hiss. You may think you've done good here, he said. I assure you that you have not. If this town falters, you will burn with them. Rodriguez nodded as he waved everyone into the truck and glanced back at Leon. He touched his left ear, and Leon nodded slightly, affirming that the detective was still alive. The cartel mole smiled faintly, and then jumped in the SUV. Reed parked the cherry truck on the side of the road and got out to watch the black cartel vehicle speed off, and Leon approached Trenton. What happened to Clara? He demanded. Nothing happened to her, Trenton replied. I just didn't think the cartel needed to know she was alive. Leon nodded and followed him back to the truck, where Reed was helping Clara out from under a blanket in the back seat. What did I miss? She asked, hopping down to the ground. Leon grinned. Me taunting El Guapo to his face. El Guapo? Clara raised an eyebrow and looked back and forth between Trenton and Reed, who held equal confusion on their faces. The boss asshole who just left, Leon said. Trenton raised a hand. Tiago Rivas? Who the fuck is El Guapo? Reed added. Leon sighed. Because he reminds me of the bad guy from the Three Amigos, he explained, shaking his head at his obvious age. And I may have to show some respect to his face, but I'll be goddamned if I show any to him or his bitch-ass son behind his back. Clara chuckled, shaking her head. Three Amigos, huh? Never saw it. Well, then we'd better add a VHS player to the list of things to scout for, then, Leon declared, giving her shoulder a squeeze, and they headed back to the command center. Chapter 19 Holy shit. Roger's eyes were as wide as saucers. You really told Angel Rivas that you'd make him call you daddy? Leon laughed. It seemed like the logical thing to do at the time. He shrugged. Let El Guapo know I'm not backing down. The detective wiped tears of mirth from his eyes. El Guapo, like three amigos. Finally, another person among us who appreciates the classics. Leon raised his hands and then shot a triumphant look at the other three. Trenton rolled his eyes and turned back to the map with all of the circles on it. Man, some of these places are gonna be difficult to get to. Those spots way south of the I-10 won't be too bad but Fort Stockton and Fort Davis are probably two-day trips away. 
We're probably going to want to avoid Fort Stockton for as long as we can, Leon pointed out. It's the biggest city between here and Junction. We're not going to have the manpower or the firepower to deal with that. Hell, we can't even clear our own backyard yet. Rogers crossed his arms. If they deliver on those weapon promises, we can start on that at least. But that's only half the problem. He rubbed his chin. We really need able-bodied people. Right now, these three are the only people who are able to venture out there. Leon took a deep breath. It's a long shot, but I'll start putting the call out to those military boys out in New Mexico, he suggested. Our scheduled chat isn't for a couple more days, but it couldn't hurt to try. That's a good idea, but the priority is finding supplies, the detective replied, shaking his head. So whenever we have satellite coverage, I'd like you to be scouring every inch of ground you can. He cocked his head, a mischievous glint in his eye. If you don't mind, Mr. Mayor. Oh, good Lord. Clara put a hand to her forehead. Leon smirked. Nah, I'm good with Mayor, he said. And on that note, I'm going to go find some food and a bed to sleep in, she announced, putting up a hand to stop him. You did good today, Clara, Trenton said softly, his voice sincere as he caught her attention. You saved the town, really. She shrugged, avoiding his gaze as if it wasn't a big deal. It's my home now, too, she said nervously just trying to do my part to carry the load. Well, you get some rest, because tomorrow morning we're back at it, he replied. She nodded and gave a little wave before hurrying out of the command center. We should be doing the same, Reed said. Trenton nodded. Good call, he agreed, and gave a salute to the duo in charge. Don't stay up too late, amigos. After a return wave, the two remaining Fabian citizens turned back to the laptop as it gave a beep. Looks like you're up, Mr. Mayor, Rogers said. Leon gave him a sly smile. I'm on it, he assured him. You should get some sleep, detective. I'll keep watch. Rogers clapped him on the back. I'll be honest, you just want free reign of the coffee pot. Only a day in and you already know me so well, Leon replied with a chuckle. The detective stepped towards the door, but then turned back to give his new companion a sincere look. Thanks for everything you did today. We might not still be here if it wasn't for you. Leon shook his head. Don't thank me yet. I get the sense this shit is just getting started. End of book three. In book four of Dead America, the second week, the action shifts to Cincinnati, where a tragic accident at one of the government stadium shelters forces a group to risk everything to survive. <laughs>